Introduction of the Life of Ludwig von Beethoven, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zane Selinsky in Lethbridge, Alberta. The Life of Ludwig von Beethoven, Volume 1, by Alexander Wheelock Thayer. Translated by Henry Edward Crabiel. 1854 to 1923. Introduction. If for no other reasons than because of the long time and monumental patience expended upon its preparation, the vicissitudes through which it has passed, and the varied and arduous labors bestowed upon it by the author and its editors, the history of Alexander Wheelock Thayer's Life of Beethoven deserves to be set forth as an introduction to his work. His work it is, and his monument, though others have labored long and painstakingly upon it. There has been no considerable time since the middle of the last century when it has not occupied the minds of the author and those who have been associated with him in its creation. Between the conception of its plan and its execution there lies a period of more than two generations. Four men have labored zealously and affectionately upon its pages and the fruits of more than four score men, stimulated to investigation by the first revelations made by the author, have been conveyed in the ultimate form of the biography. It was seventeen years after Mr. Thayer entered upon what proved to be his life task before he gave the first volume to the world, and then in a foreign tongue. It was thirteen more before the third volume came from the press. This volume, moreover, left the work unfinished, and thirty-two years more had to elapse before it was completed. When this was done, the patient and self-sacrificing investigator was dead. He did not live to finish it himself, nor to see it finished by his faithful collaborator of many years, Dr. Dieters. Neither did he live to look upon a single printed page in the language in which he had written that portion of the work published in his lifetime. It was left for another hand to prepare the English edition of an American writer's history of Germany's greatest tone poet, and to write its concluding chapters, as he believes, in the spirit of the original author. Under these circumstances there can be no vainglory in asserting that the appearance of this edition of Thayer's Life of Beethoven deserves to be set down as a significant occurrence in musical history. In it is told for the first time in the language of the great biographer the true story of the man Beethoven, his history stripped of the silly sentimental romance with which early writers and their later imitators and copyists invested it so thickly that the real humanity, the humanliness, of the composer has never been presented to the world. In this biography there appears the veritable Beethoven, set down in his true environment of men and things, the man as he actually was, the man as he himself, like Cromwell, ask to be shown for the information of posterity. It is doubtful if any other great man's history has been so encrusted with fiction as Beethoven's. Except Thayer's, no biography of him has been written which presents him in his true light. The majority of the books which have been written of late years repeat many of the errors and falsehoods made current in the first books which were written about him. A great many of these errors and falsehoods are in the account of the composer's last sickness and death and were either inventions or exaggerations designed by their utterers to add pathos to a narrative, which, in unadorned truth, is a hundredfold more pathetic than any tale of fiction could possibly be. Other errors have concealed the truth in the story of Beethoven's guardianship of his nephew, his relations with his brothers, the origin and nature of his fatal illness, his dealings with his publishers and patrons, the generous attempt of the Philharmonic Society of London to extend help to him when upon his deathbed. In many details, the story of Beethoven's life, as told here, will be new to English and American readers. In a few cases, the details will be new to the world, for the English edition of Thayer's biography is not a translation of the German work, but a presentation of the original manuscript, so far as the discoveries made after the writing did not mar its integrity, supplemented by the knowledge acquired since the publication of the first German edition, and placed at the service of the present editor, by the German revisers of the second edition. The editor of this English edition was not only in communication with Mr. Thayer during the last ten years of his life, but was also associated to some extent with his continuator and translator, Dr. Dieters. 
not only the fruits of the labors of the German editors, but the original manuscript of Thayer, and the mass of material which he accumulated came into the hands of this writer, and they form the foundation on which the English Thayer's Beethoven rests. The work is a vastly different one from that which Thayer dreamed of when he first conceived the idea of bringing order and consistency into the fragmentary and highly colored accounts of the composer's life upon which he fed his mind and fancy as a student at college. But it is, even in the part of the story which he did not write, true to the conception of what Beethoven's biography should be. Knowledge of the composer's life has greatly increased since the time when Thayer set out upon his task. The first publication of some of the results of his investigation, in his Chronologisches Verzeichnis in 1865, and the first volume of the biography which appeared a year later, stirred the critical historians into activity throughout Europe. For them he had opened up a hundred avenues of research, pointed out a hundred subjects for special study. At once, collectors of autographs brought forth their treasures. Old men opened up the books of their memories. Librarians gave eager searchers access to their shelves, churches produced their archives, and hieroglyphic sketches which had been scattered all over Europe were deciphered by scholars and yielded up chronological information of inestimable value. To all these activities Thayer had pointed the way, and thus a great mass of facts was added to the already great mass which Thayer had accumulated. Nor did Thayer's labors in the field end with the first publication of his volumes. So long as he lived, he gathered, ordered, and sifted the new material which came under his observation, and prepared it for incorporation into later editions and later volumes. After he was dead, his editors continued the work. Alexander Wheelock Thayer was born in South Natick, Massachusetts, on October 22, 1817, and received a liberal education at Harvard College, whence he was graduated in 1843. He probably felt that he was cut out for a literary career, for his first work after graduation was done in the library of his alma mater. There, interest in the life of Beethoven took hold of him. With the plan in his mind of writing an account of that life on the basis of Schindler's biography, as paraphrased by Moscheles, and bringing its statements of those contained in the Biographisches Notizen of Wegeler and Ries, and a few English accounts into harmony, he went to Europe in 1849 and spent two years in making researches in Bonn, Berlin, Prague, and Vienna. He then returned to America, and in 1852 became attached to the editorial staff of the New York Tribune. It was, in a double sense, an attachment. Illness compelled him to abandon journalism and sever his connection with the newspaper within two years, but he never gave up his interest in it. He read it until the day of his death, and his acquaintance with the member of the Tribune staff, who is destined to have a part in the completion of his life work, began when, a little more than a generation after he had gone to Europe for the second time, he opened a correspondence with him on a topic suggested by one of the writer's criticisms. In 1854, he went to Europe again, still fired with the ambition to rid the life history of Beethoven of the defects which marred it as told in the current books. Schindler had sold the memorabilia which he had received from Beethoven and Beethoven's friend Stefan von Brüning to the Prussian government, and the precious documents were safely housed in the Royal Library at Berlin. It was probably in studying them that Thayer realized fully that it was necessary to do more than rectify and harmonize current accounts of Beethoven's life, if it were correctly to be told. He had already unearthed much precious ore at Bonn, but he lacked the money which alone would enable him to do the long and large work which now loomed before him. In 1856 he again came back to America and sought employment, finding it this time in South Orange, New Jersey, where Lowell Mason employed him to catalogue his musical library. Meanwhile, Dr. Mason had become interested in his great project, and Mrs. Mehetabel Adams of Cambridge, Massachusetts also. Together they provided the funds which enabled him again to go to Europe, where he now took up a permanent residence. At first he spent his time in research travels, visiting Berlin, Bonn, Cologne, Dusseldorf, where he found material of great value in the archives of the old electoral courts of Bonn and Cologne, Frankfurt, Paris, Linz, Graz, Salzburg, London, and Vienna. To support himself, he took a small post in the legation of the United States at Vienna, 
but exchanged this after a space for the U.S. consulship at Trieste, to which office he was appointed by President Lincoln on the recommendation of Senator Sumner. In Trieste, he remained till his death, although out of office after October 1, 1882. To Sir George Grove, he wrote under date June 1, 1895, I was compelled to resign my office because of utter inability longer to continue Beethoven work and official labor together. From Trieste, when his duties permitted, he went out on occasional exploring tours, and there he weighed his accumulations of evidence and wrote his volumes. In his travels, Thayer visited every person of importance then living who had been in any way associated with Beethoven or had personal recollection of him. Schindler, the composer's factotum and biographer, Anselm Hüttenbrenner, in whose arms he died, Caroline van Beethoven, widow of nephew Karl, Charles Neat and Cipriani Potter, the English musicians who had been his pupils, Sir George Smart, who had visited him to learn the proper interpretation of the Ninth Symphony, Moscheles, who had been a professional association in Vienna, Otto Jan, who had undertaken a like task with his own, but abandoned it and turned over his gathered material to him, Mahler, an artist who had painted Beethoven's portrait, Gerhard von Brüning, son of Beethoven's most intimate friend, who, as a lad of fourteen, had been a cheery companion of the great man when he lay upon his faithful bed of sickness. With all these and many others he talked, carefully recording their testimony in his notebooks, and piling up information with which to test the correctness of traditions and printed accounts, and to amplify the veracious story of Beethoven's life. His industry, zeal, keen power of analysis, candor, and far-mindedness won the confidence and help of all with whom he came in contact, except the literary charlatans whose romances he was bent on destroying in the interest of the verities of history. The Royal Library of Berlin sent the books in which many of Beethoven's visitors had written down their parts of the conversations which the composer could not hear, to him at Trieste, so that he might transcribe and study them at his leisure. In 1865, Thayer was ready with the manuscript for volume one of the work, which contained a sketch of the courts of the electors of Cologne, and Cologne and Bonn for over a century, told of the music cultivated at them, and recorded the ancestry of Beethoven so far as it had been discovered. It also carried the history of the composer down to the year 1796. In Bonn, Thayer had made the acquaintance of Dr. Hermann Deiters, court counselor and enthusiastic musical littérateur, and to him he confided the task of editing and revising his manuscript and translating it into German. The reason which Thayer gave for not at once publishing his work in English was that he was unable to oversee the printing in his native land, where, moreover, it was not the custom to publish such works serially. He urged upon his collaborator that he practice literalness of translation in respect of his own utterances, but gave him full liberty to proceed according to his judgment in the presentation of documentary evidence. All of the material in the volume except the drafts from Wegler, Ries, and Schindler, with which he was frequently in conflict, was original discovery, the result of the labors begun in Bonn in 1849. His principles he set forth in these words, I fight for no theories and cherish no prejudices. My sole point of view is the truth. I have resisted the temptation to discuss the character of his, Beethoven's, works, and to make such a discussion the foundation of historical speculation, referring to leave such matters to those who have a greater predilection for them. It appears to me that Beethoven the composer is amply known through his works, and in this assumption the long and wearisome labors of so many years were devoted to Beethoven the man. The plan to publish his work in German enabled Thayer to turn over all his documentary evidence to Dieters in its original shape, a circumstance which saved him great labor, but left it for his American editor and continuator. The first German volume appeared in 1866. Its stimulative effect upon musical Europe has been indicated. Volume 2 came from the press in 1872, Volume 3 in 1879, both translated and annotated by Dieters. They brought the story of Beethoven's life down to the year of 1816, leaving a little more than a decade still to be discussed. The health of Thayer had never been robust, 
and the long and uninterminate application to the work of gathering and weighing evidence had greatly taxed his brain. He became subject to severe headaches, and after the appearance of the third volume, he found it impossible to apply himself for even a short time to work upon the biography. In July 1890, he wrote a letter to Sir George Grove, which the latter forwarded to this writer. In it, he tells in words of pathetic gratitude of the unexpected honor showered upon him at Bonn, when at the invitation of the Beethoven House Verein, he attended the exhibition and festival given in Beethoven's birthplace a short time before. Then he proceeds, Of course the great question was on the lips of all. When will the fourth volume appear? I could only say, When the condition of my head allows it. No one could see or have from my general appearance the least suspicion that I was not in mental equal to my physical vigor. In fact, the extreme excitement of these three weeks took off for the time twenty years of my age and made me young again. But afterwards in Hamburg and in Berlin the reaction came. Spite of the delightful musical parties at Joachim's, Hausmann's, Mendelssohn's, my head broke down more and more, and since my return hither, July 3rd, has as yet shown small signs of recuperation. The extreme importance of working out my fourth volume is more than ever impressed upon my mind, and weighs upon me like an incubus. But as yet, it is still utterly impossible for me to really work. Of course, I only live for that great purpose, and do not despair. My general health is such that I think the brain must in time recover something of its vigor and power of labor. What astonishes me, and almost creates envy, is to see this wonderful power of labor as exemplified by you and my neighbor, Burton. But from boyhood I have had head troubles, and what I went through with for thirty years in supporting myself, and working on Beethoven is not to be described, and excites my wonder that I did not succumb. Well, I will not yet despair. Thayer's mind, active enough in some things, refused to occupy itself with the Beethoven material. It needed distraction, and to give it that he turned to the literary work of another character. He wrote a book against the Baconian authorship of Shakespeare's works, another one on the Hebrews in Egypt and their exodus, which Mr. E. S. Wilcox, a friend of many years, published at his request in Peoria, Illinois. He also wrote essays and children's tales. Such writing he could do, and also attend to his counselor duties. But an hour or two of thought devoted to Beethoven, as he said in a letter to the present writer, brought on a racking headache and unfitted him for labor of any kind. Meanwhile, year after year passed, and the final volume of the biography was no nearer its completion than in 1880. In fact, beyond the selection and ordination of its material, it was scarcely begun. His friends and the lovers of Beethoven the world over grew seriously concerned. The editor of the present edition developed a plan which he thought would enable Thayer to complete the work, notwithstanding the disabilities under which he was laboring. He asked the cooperation of Novello, Ewer, and Company of London, and got them to promise to send a capable person to Trieste, to act as a sort of literary secretary to Thayer. It was thought that having all the material for the concluding volume on hand chronologically arranged, he might talk it over with the secretary, but without giving care to the manner of literary presentation. The secretary was then to give the material a proper setting and submit it to Thayer for leisurely revision. Very hopefully, and with feelings of deep gratitude to his friends, the English publishers, the American editor submitted his plan. But Thayer would have none of it. Though unable to work upon the biography for an hour continuously, he yet clung to the notion that some day he would not only finish it, but also rewrite the whole for English and American readers. From one of the letters placed at my disposal by Sir George Grove, it appears that subsequently, in 1892, there was some correspondence between an English publisher and Mr. Thayer touching on an English edition. The letter was written to Sir George on June 1, 1895. In it, he says, quote, I then hope to be able to revise and prepare it, the Beethoven manuscript, for publication myself, and was able to begin the labor and arrange with a typewriting woman to make the clean copy. How sadly I failed, I wrote you. 
Since that time, the subject has not been renewed between us. I am now compelled to relinquish all hope of ever being able to do the work. There are two great difficulties to be overcome. The one is that all letters and citations are in the original German as they were sent to Dr. Dieters. The other, there is much to be condensed, as I always intended, should be for this reason. From the very first chapter to the end of Volume 3, I am continually in conflict with all previous writers, and was compelled, therefore, to show in my text that I was right by so using my materials that the reader should be taken along step by step, and compelled to see the truth for himself. Had all my arguments been given in notes, nine readers out of ten would hardly have read them, and I should have been involved in numberless and endless controversies. Now the case has changed. Alexander Wheelock Thayer's novelties are now, with few if any exceptions, accepted as facts, and can, in the English edition, be used as such. Besides this, there is much new matter to be inserted, and some corrections to be made from the appendices of the three German volumes. The prospect now is that I may be able to do some of this work, or at all events, go through my manuscript page by page, and do much to facilitate its preparation for publication in English. I have no expectation from ever receiving any pecuniary recompense for my forty years of labor, for my many years of poverty arising from the costs of my extensive researches, for my... but enough of this also." End quote. In explanation of the final sentence in this letter, it may be added that Thayer told the present writer that he had never received a penny from his publisher for the three German volumes. Nothing more, in fact, than a few books which he had ordered, and for which the publisher made no charge. Thus matters rested when Thayer died on July 15, 1897. The thought that the fruits of his labor and great sacrifices should be lost to the world, even in part, was intolerable. Dr. Dieters, with undiminished zeal and enthusiasm, announced his willingness to revise the three published volumes for a second edition, and write the concluding volume. Meanwhile, all of Thayer's papers had been sent to Mrs. J. Baz Fox of Cambridge, Massachusetts, the author's niece and one of his heirs. There was a large mass of material, and it became necessary to sift it in order that all that was needful for the work of revision and completion might be placed in the hands of Dr. Dieters. This work was done, at Mrs. Fox's request, by the present writer, who also, at Mrs. Fox's request, undertook the task of preparing this English edition. Dr. Dieters accomplished the work of revising Volume 1, which was published by Weber, the original publisher of the German volumes in 1891. He then decided that, before taking up the revision of Volumes 2 and 3, he would bring the biography to a conclusion. He wrote not one volume which Thayer had hoped would suffice him, but two volumes, the mass of material bearing on the last decade of Beethoven's life having grown so large that it could not conveniently be comprehended in a single tome especially since Dr. Dieters had determined to incorporate critical discussions of the composer's principal works in the new edition. The advanced sheets of Volume 4 were in Dr. Dieters' hands when, full of years and honors, he died on May 1, 1907. Breitkopf and Hartel had meanwhile purchased the German copyright from Weber, and they chose Dr. Hugo Riemann to complete the work of revision. Under Dr. Riemann's supervision, Volumes 4 and 5 were brought out in 1908, and Volumes 2 and 3 in 1910 1911. Not until this had been accomplished could the American collaborator go systematically to work on his difficult and voluminous task, for he had determined to use as much as possible of Thayer's original manuscript and adhere to Thayer's original purpose and that expressed in his letter to Sir George Grove. He also thought it wise to condense the work so as to bring it within three volumes and to seek to enhance its readableness in other ways. To this end, he abolished the many appendices which swelled the German volumes, and put their significant portions into the body of the narrative. He omitted many of the hundreds of footnotes, especially the references to the works of the earlier biographers, believing that the special student would easily find the sources if he wished to do so, and the general reader would not care to verify the statements of one who had been accepted as the court of last resort in all matters of fact pertaining to Beethoven, the man. He also omitted many letters and presented the substance of others in his own words for the reason that they can all be consulted in the special volumes which contain the composer's correspondence. Of the letters and other documents used in the pages which follow, he 
be made translations for the sake of accuracy, as well as to avoid conflict with the copyright privileges of the publishers of English versions. Being as free as the German editors in respect of the portion of the biography which did not come directly from the pen of Thayer, the editor of this English edition shows his own method of presentation touching the story of the last decade of Beethoven's life, keeping in view the greater clearness and rapidity of narrative which, he believed, would result from the grouping of material different from that followed by the German editors in their adherence to the strict chronological method established by Thayer. A large number of variations from the text of the original German edition are explained in the body of this work or in footnotes. In cases where the German editors were found to be in disagreement with the English manuscript, in matters of opinion merely, the editor has chosen to let Mr. Thayer's argument stand, though as a rule he has noted the adverse opinion of the German revisers also. A prominent instance of this kind is presented by the mysterious love letter found secreted in Beethoven's desk after his death. Though a considerable literature has grown up around the immortal beloved, since Thayer advanced the hypothesis that the lady was Countess Therese Prinzwick, the question touching her identity and the dates of the letters is still as much an open one as it was when Thayer, in his characteristic manner, subjected it to examination. This editor has therefore permitted Thayer not only to present his case in his own words, but helped him by bringing his scattered pleadings and briefs into sequence. He has also outlined in part the discussion which follows the promulgation of Thayer's theory, and advanced a few fugitive reflections of his own. The related incident of Beethoven's vain matrimonial project has been put into a different category by new evidence which came to light when Dr. Riemann was engaged in his revisory work. It became necessary, therefore, that the date of the incident be changed from 1807, where Thayer had put it, to 1810. By this important change, Beethoven's relations to Thérèse Malfatti were made to take on a more serious attitude than Thayer was willing to accord them. In this edition, finally, more importance is attached to the so-called Fisher manuscript than Thayer was inclined to give it, though he, somewhat grudgingly, we fear, consented that Dr. Dieters should print it with critical comments in the appendix of his volume one. The manuscript, though known to Thayer, had come to the attention of Dr. Dieters too late for use in the narrative portion of the volume, though it was thus used in the second edition. The story of the manuscript, which is now preserved in the museum of the Beethoven Hausverein in Bonn, is a curious one. Its author was Gottfried Fischer, whose ancestors for four generations had lived in the house in Rheingasse, where only a few years ago was still though mendaciously, pointed out to strangers as the house in which Beethoven was born. Fischer, who lived till 1864, was born in the house which formerly stood on the site of the present building known as number 934, ten years after Beethoven's eyes opened to the light in the Bongasse. At the time of Fischer's birth, the Beethoven family occupied a portion of the house, and Fischer's father and the composer's father were friends and companions. There, too, had lived the composer's grandfather. Gottfried Fischer had a sister, Cecilia Fischer, who was born eight years before Beethoven. She remained unmarried and lived to be 85 years old, dying on May 23, 1845. The festivities attending to the unveiling of the Beethoven monument in 1838 brought many visitors to Bonn and natural curiosity concerning the relics of the composer. Inquirers were referred to the house in the Rheingasse, then supposed to be the birthplace of the composers, where the Fishers, brother and sister, still lived. They told their story and were urged by eager listeners to put it into writing. This Gottfried did the same year, but keeping the manuscript in hand, he added to it at intervals down to the year 1857 at least. He came to attach great value to his revelations, and as time went on, embellished his recital with a mass of notes, many of no value, many consisting of iterations and reiterations of incidents already recorded, and also with excerpts from books to which, in his simplicity, he thought that nobody but himself had access. He was an uneducated man, ignorant even of the correct use of the German language. It is therefore not surprising that much of his record is utterly worthless, but mixed with the dross there is much precious metal, especially in the spinster's recollection of the composer's father and grandfather. For while Gottfried grew senile, his sister remained mentally vigorous to the end. 
Thayer examined the document and offered to buy it, but was dissuaded by the seemingly exorbitant price which the old man set upon it. It was finally purchased for the city's archives by the Oberbürgmeister, and thus came to the notice of Dr. Dieters. His use of it has been followed by the present editor. Henry Edward Craybill, Blue Hill, Maine, USA, July, 1914. Postscript. The breaking out in August 1914 of the war between Austria and Serbia, which eventually involved nearly all the civilized nations of the world, led the publishers, who had originally undertaken to print this work, as brought to a conclusion by the American editor, indefinitely to postpone its publication. In the spring of 1920, the Beethoven Association, composed of musicians of high rank who had given a remarkably successful series of concerts of Beethoven's chamber music in New York in the season 1919-1920, at the suggestion of O.G. Sonic and Harold Bauer, resolved to devote the proceeds of the concerts to promoting the publication of Thayer's biography. To this act of artistic philanthropy, the appearance of the work is due. H.E.K. Blue Hill, Maine, USA, September 1920. End of introduction. Recording by Zane Selinsky. Section 1 of the Life of Ludwig von Beethoven, Volume 1 by Alexander Wheelock Thayer, translated by Henry Edward Grable, 1854-1923. to This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1, Part 1. Introductory, The Electors of Cologne in the 18th Century, Joseph Clemens, Clemens August and Max Friedrich, the Electoral Courts and their music, musical culture in Bonn at the time of Beethoven's birth, appearance of the city in 1770. One of the compensations for the horrors of the French Revolution was the sweeping away of many of the petty sovereignties into which Germany was divided, thereby rendering in our day a union of the german people and the rise of a german nation possible the first to fall were the numerous ecclesiastical civil members of the old loose confederation some of which had played no ignoble nor unimportant part in the advance of civilization but their day was past the people of these states had in divers respects enjoyed a better lot than those who were subjects of hereditary rulers and the old german saying it is good to dwell under the crook had a basis of fact at the least they were not sold as mercenary troops their blood was not shed on foreign fields to support their princes ostentatious splendor to enable mistresses and ill-begotten children to live in luxury and riot but the antiquated ideas to which the ecclesiastical rulers held with bigoted tenacity had become a barrier to progress the exceptions being too few to render their farther existence desirable these members of the empire greatly differing in extent population wealth and political influence were ruled with few or no exceptions by men who owed their positions to election by chapters or other church corporations whose numbers were so limited as to give full play to every sort of intrigue but they could not assume their functions until their titles were confirmed by the pope as head of the church and by the emperor as head of the confederation thus the subject had no voice in the matter and it hardly need be said that his welfare and prosperity were never included among the motives and considerations on which the elections turned the seas by their charters and statutes we think without exception were bestowed upon men of noble birth they were benefices and sinecures for younger sons of princely houses estates set apart and consecrated to the use 
emolument and enjoyment of german john lackland's in the long list of their incumbents a name here and there appears that calls up historic associations a man of letters who aided in the increase or diffusion of the cumbrous learning of his time a warrior who exchanged his robes for a coat of mail a politician who played a part more or less honorable or the reverse in the affairs and intrigues of the empire and very rarely one whose daily walk and conversation reflected in some measure the life and principles of the founder of christianity in general as they owed their places wholly to political and family influences so they assumed the vows and garb of churchmen as necessary steps to the enjoyment of lives of affluence and pleasure so late as far into the eighteenth century travelling was slow laborious and expensive hence save for the few more wealthy and powerful journeys at long intervals to a council an imperial coronation or a diet of the empire were the rare interruptions to the monotony of their daily existence not having the power to transmit their sees to their children these ecclesiastics had the less inducement to rule with an eye to the welfare of their subjects on the other hand the temptation was very strong to augment their revenues for the benefit of relatives and dependents and especially for the gratification of their own tastes and inclinations among which the love of splendor and ostentatious display was a fruitful source of waste and extravagance confined so largely to their own small capitals with little intercourse except with their immediate neighbors they were far more dependent upon their own resources for amusement than the hereditary princes and what so obvious so easily obtained and so satisfactory as music the theatre and the dance thus every little court became a conservatory of these arts and for generations most of the great names in them may be found recorded in the court calendars one is therefore not surprised to learn how many of the more distinguished musical composers began life as singing boys in cathedral choirs of england and germany the secular princes especially those of high rank had besides their civil administration the stirring events of war questions of public policy schemes and intrigues for the advancement of family interests and the like to engage their attention but the ecclesiastic leaving the civil administration as a rule in the hands of ministers had little to occupy him officially but a tedious routine of religious forms and ceremonies to him therefore the theatre and music for the mass the opera the ballroom and the salon were matters of great moment they filled a wide void and were cherished accordingly the three german ecclesiastical princes who possessed the greatest power and influence were the archbishops of mayence trevis and cologne electors of the empire and rulers of the fairest regions of the rhine peace appears hardly to have been known between the city of cologne and its earlier archbishops and in the thirteenth century a long continued and even bloody quarrel resulted in the victory of the city it remained a free imperial town the archbishops retained no civil or political power within its walls not even the right to remain there more than three days at any one time thus it happened that in the year twelve fifty seven archbishop engelbert selected bonn for his residence and formally made it the capital of the electorate as it remained until elector and court were swept away in seventeen ninety four of the last four electors of cologne the first was joseph clemens a bavarian prince nephew of his predecessor maximilian heinrich the choice of the chapter by a vote of thirteen to nine had been cardinal furstenberg but his known or supposed devotion to the interests of the french king had prevented the ratification of the election by either the emperor or the pope a new one being ordered resulted in favor of the bavarian then a youth of eighteen years the pope had ratified his election and appointed a bishop to perform his ecclesiastical functions ad interim and the emperor invested him with the electoral dignity december the first sixteen eighty nine 
thus it says of him like two of his predecessors he was the incumbent of five sees he was archbishop of cologne bishop of hildesheim liege ratisbon and freisingen his love for pomp and splendor was a passion which he gratified in the magnificence of his court he delighted to draw thither beautiful and intellectual women madame de raisbeck and countess fugger wife of his chief equerry were his declared favorites for seventeen years that is until the disastrous year seventeen hundred and six when fenelon consecrated him he delayed assuming his vows he held the opinion universal in the courts of those days that he might with a clear conscience enjoy life after the manner of secular princes in pleasing the ladies he was utterly regardless of expense and for their amusement gave magnificent balls splendid masquerades musical and dramatic entertainments and hunting parties saint simon relates that several years of his exile were passed at valenciennes where though a fugitive he followed the same round of costly pleasures and amusements he also records one of the elector's jests which in effrontery surpasses anything related of his contemporary dean swift some time after his consecration he caused public notice to be given that on the approaching first of april he would preach at the appointed time he mounted the pulpit bowed gravely made the sign of the cross shouted zum april april fool and retired amid a flourish of trumpets and the rolling of drums dr ennen labors energetically to prove that joseph clemens's fondness in later years for joining in all grand church ceremonies rested upon higher motives than the mere pleasure of displaying himself in his magnificent robes and affirms that after assuming his priestly vows he led a life devoted to the church and worthy of his order thenceforth never seeing madame de raisbeck mother of his illegitimate children except in the presence of a third person it seems proper to say this much concerning a prince whose electorship is the point of departure for notices of music and musicians in bond during the eighteenth century a prince whose fondness for the art led him at home and in exile to support both vocal and instrumental bands on a scale generous for that age and who moreover made some pretensions to the title of composer himself as we learn from a letter which under date of july the twentieth seventeen twenty he wrote to a court councillor rauch to accompany eleven of his motets it is an amusingly frank letter beginning with the confession that he was an ignorant who knew nothing about notes and had absolutely no knowledge of music wherefore he admits that his manner of composing is very odd being compelled to sing anything that came into his head to a composer whose duty it was to bring the ideas to paper nevertheless he is quite satisfied with himself at all events i must have a good ear and gusto for the public that has heard has always approved but the methodum which i have adopted is that of the bees that draw and collect the honey from the sweetest flowers so also i have taken all that i have composed from good masters whose musicalian please me thus i freely confess my pilfering which others deny and try to appropriate what they have taken from others let no one therefore get angry if he hears old arias in it for as they are beautiful the old is not deprived of its praise i ascribe everything to the grace of god who enlightened me the unknowing to do these things not all composers royal or mean are as honest as the old elector it is fortunate for the present purpose that the portion of the electoral archives discovered after a lapse of nearly seventy years and now preserved at dusseldorf consists so largely of documents relating to the musical establishment of the court at bonn during the last century of its existence they rarely afford information upon the character of the music performed but are sufficiently complete when supplemented by the annual court calendars to determine with reasonable correctness the number character position and condition of its members the few petitions and decrees hereafter to be given in full because of the connection with the beethovens suffice for specimens of the long series of similar documents 
uniform in character and generally of too little interest to be worth transcription in sixteen ninety five a decree issued at liege by joseph clemens then in that city as titular bishop though not consecrated adds three new names to the hof musicae one of which van den eden constantly reappears in the documents and calendars down to the year seventeen eighty two from a list of payments at liege in the second quarter of sixteen ninety six we find that henry van den eden heinrich van den eden was a bass singer and that the aggregate of vocalists instrumentists with the organ blower calcant was eighteen persons returned to bonn joseph clemens resumed his plan of improving his music and for those days of small orchestras and niggardly salaries he set it upon a rather generous foundation a decree of april the first sixteen ninety eight put in force the next month names twenty-two persons with salaries aggregating eight thousand eight hundred and ninety florins after the death of maximilian heinrich the government passed into the hands of cardinal furstenberg his coadjutor who owed the position to the intrigues of louis the fourteenth and now used it by all possible means to promote french interests the king's troops under french commanders he admitted into the principal towns of the electorate and for his own protection a french garrison of ten thousand men into bonn war was the consequence an imperial army successfully invaded the province and advancing to the capital subjected its unfortunate inhabitants to all the horrors of a relentless siege that ended october the fifteenth sixteen eighty nine in the expulsion of the garrison now reduced to some three thousand nine hundred men of whom one thousand five hundred were invalids yet in the war of the spanish succession which opened in seventeen hundred and one notwithstanding the terrible lesson taught only eleven years before the infatuated joseph clemens embraced the party of louis emperor leopold treated him with singular mildness in vain the elector persisted in seventeen hundred and two he was therefore excluded from the civil government and fled from bonn the ecclesiastical authority in cologne being empowered by the emperor to rule in his stead the next year the great success of the french armies against the allies was celebrated by joseph clemens with all pomp in namur where he then was but his triumph was short john churchill then earl of marlborough took the field as commander-in-chief of the armies of the allies his foresight energy and astonishing skill in action justified addison's simile whether sublime or only pompous of the angel riding in the whirlwind and directing the storm he was soon at cologne whence he dispatched cotchorn to besiege bonn that great general executed his task with such skill and impetuosity that on may the fifteenth seventeen hundred and three all was ready for storming the city when d'allegre the french commander offered to capitulate and on the nineteenth was allowed to retire now was bond for the third time wrested from the hands of the french and restored to the archbishopric but alas in a condition that aroused indignation grief and compassion on all sides says muller leopold was still kindly disposed toward joseph clemens but he died may the fifth seventeen hundred and five and his successor joseph the first immediately declared him under the ban of the empire this deprived him of the means and opportunities as elector for indulging his passion for pomp and display while his neglect hitherto under dispensations from the pope to take the vows necessary to the performance of ecclesiastical functions was likewise fatal to that indulgence as archbishop but this could be remedied then along the famous archbishop of cambray ordained him subdeacon august fifteenth seventeen hundred and six the bishop of tournay made him deacon december the eighth and priest on the twenty fifth on january the first seventeen hundred and seven he read his first mass at lille and indulged his passion for parade to the full as a pamphlet describing the incident and silver and copper medals commemorating it still events two years later may the first seventeen hundred and nine joseph clemens received from fenelon in Reisel, lille episcopal consecration and the pallium muller upon the victory of oudenard by marlborough 
and the fall of lille he took refuge in mons the treaty of rastadt march seventeen fourteen restored him to his electoral dignities and he returned to the rhine but dutch troops continued to hold bonn until december the eleventh seventeen fifteen on the morning of that day they evacuated the city and in the afternoon the elector entered in a grand solemn procession commemorated by an issue of silver medals during all these vicissitudes joseph clemens from whatever source he derived the means did not suffer his music to deteriorate and returned to bonn no sooner was the public business regulated and restored to its former routine than he again turned his attention to its improvement joseph clemens died november the twelfth seventeen twenty three having previously secured the succession to his nephew clemens august last of the five electors of cologne of the bavarian line the new incumbent third son of maximilian emmanuel elector of bavaria and his second wife a daughter of the celebrated john sobieski of poland was born august the seventeenth seventeen hundred at brussels where his father resided at the time as governor-general from his fourth to his fifteenth year he had been held in captivity by the austrians at klagenfurt and graz then having been destined for the church he spent several years at study in rome as a child in seventeen fifteen he had been appointed coadjutor to the bishop of regensburg in seventeen nineteen he was elected to the two sees of powderborn and munster made vacant by the death of his brother moritz was chosen coadjutor to his uncle of cologne in seventeen twenty two made his solemn entry into bonn as elector may the fifteenth seventeen twenty four was the same year also elected bishop of hildesheim in seventeen twenty five provost of the cathedral at liege seventeen twenty eight bishop of osnabruck and finally in seventeen thirty two reached the dignity of grand master of the teutonic order his rule is distinguished in the annals of the electorate for little else than the building repairing renewing and embellishing of palaces hunting seats churches convents and other edifices at bonn he erected the huge pile the foundation of which had been laid by his uncle now the seat of the university the handsome city hall was also his work the villa at poppelsdorf was enlarged by him into a small palace clemens rue now the university museum of natural history in brule the augustusburg now a prussian royal palace dates from his reign and munster mergentheim arnsberg and other places show similar monuments of his prodigality in the indulgence of his taste for splendour monstrous were the sums says dr ennen squandered by him in the purchase of splendid ornaments magnificent equipages furniture costly for its variety and of curious works of art upon festivities slaying parties masquerades operas dramas and ballets upon charlatans swindlers female vocalists actors and dancers his theatre and opera alone cost him fifty thousand dollars annually and the magnificence of his masked balls twice a week in winter is proof sufficient that no small sums were lavished upon them the aggregate of the revenues derived from the several states of which clemens august was the head nowhere appears but the civil income of the electorate alone had in his later years risen from the million of florins of his predecessor to about the same number of dollars an increase of some forty per centum added to this were large sums derived from the church and subsidies from austria france and the seacoast states amounting to at least fourteen million francs indeed during the elector's last ten years the french subsidies alone made an aggregate of at least seven million three hundred thousand francs in seventeen twenty eight holland paid on account of the clemens canal seventy six thousand dollars at the centennial opening of the strong box of the teutonic order he obtained the fat accumulations of a hundred years and twenty-five years later he opened it again yet though during his rule peace was hardly interrupted in his part of europe he plunged ever deeper and more inextricably into debt leaving one of large proportions as his legacy to his successor he was a bad ruler but a kindly amiable and popular man how should he know or feel the value of money or the necessity of prudence his childhood had been spent in captivity his student years in rome where precisely at that period poetry and music were cultivated 
if not in very noble and manly forms at least with a medician splendor the society of the arcadians was in full activity true both clemens august and his brother were under the age which enabled them to be enrolled as shepherds and consequently their names appear neither in crescembini nor in quadrio but it is not to be supposed that two young princes already bishops by election and certain of still higher dignities in the future were excluded from the palaces of ruspoli and ataboni from those brilliant literary artistic and luxurious circles in which only half a dozen years before their young countrymen the musician handel had found so cordial a welcome those were very expensive tastes as the citation from ennin shows which the future elector brought with him from rome italian palaces italian villas churches gardens music songstresses mistresses an italian holy staircase on the kreutzberg leading to nothing italian pictures mosaics and what not all these things cost money but must he not have them this elector is perhaps the only archbishop on record to whose epitaph may truthfully be added he danced out of this world into some other which happened in this wise having in the winter of seventeen sixty to sixty one by some unexpected stroke of good fortune succeeded in obtaining from the usually prudent and careful bankers of holland a loan of eighty thousand dollars he embraced the opportunity of making a long-desired visit to his family in munich owing to a sudden attack of illness he was once on the point of turning back soon after leaving bonn he persevered however reached Koblenz, and crossed over to the palace of the elector of trevis at aaron breitstein where he arrived at four p m february the fifth seventeen sixty one at dinner an hour later he was unable to eat but at the ball which followed he could not resist the fascination of the baroness von waldendorf sister of his transparency of trevis and danced with her eight or nine turns of course he could not refuse a similar compliment to several other ladies the physical exertion of dancing joined to the excitement of the occasion and following a dreary winter day's journey was too much for the enfeebled constitution of a man of sixty years he fainted in the ballroom was carried to his chamber and died next day it seems to have been the etiquette that when an elector breathed his last the musical chapel expired with him at all events no other explanation appears of the fact that so many of the petitions for membership which are still preserved should be signed by men who had already been named in the court calendars it is also to be remarked that some of the petitioners received appointments without salary these seem to have been appointments of the kind which in later years were distinguished in the records and in the calendars by the term accessist and which according to the best lights afforded by the archives may be considered as having been provisional until the incumbent had proved his skill and capacity or until a vacancy occurred through the death or resignation of some old member there are indications that the accessists though without fixed salary received some small remuneration for their services but this is by no means certain it would seem that both vocalists and instrumentists who received salaries out of the state revenues were limited to a fixed number that the amount of funds devoted to this object was also strictly limited and the costs incurred by the engagement of superior artists with extra salaries or by an increase of the number were defrayed from the elector's privy purse that the position of accessionist was sought by young musicians as a stepping-stone turned to some future vacancy which when acquired ensured a gradually increasing income during the years of service and a small pension when superannuated that the etiquette of the court demanded even in cases when the elector expressly calls some distinguished artist a bond that the appointment should be apparently only in gracious answer to an humble petition and that with few exceptions both singers and members of the orchestra were employed in the church the theatre and the concert room clemens august made his formal entry into bonn may the fifteenth seventeen twenty four a number of petitions are passed over but one granted without salary on february the eighteenth seventeen twenty seven from van den eden must be given in its entirety supplique très humble a s s c de cologne pour g van den eed bon d eighteen february seventeen twenty seven prince serenissime monseigneur 
vandenis vient avec tout le respect qui lui est possible se mettre au pied de v a s e lui représente coriant ou l'honneur d'avoir être ce qu'on organise de feu s a s e d'heureuse mémoire elle daigne lui vouloir faire la même grâce ne demandant aucun gage si long terme qu'il plaira à v a s e pour maintenant la servir avec soin et diligence quoi faisant etc etc on the same date van den eden received his appointment as second court organist june the eighth seventeen twenty eight a decree is issued granting him a salary of one hundred florins to a third petition the next year signed van den enden the answer is an increase of his salary to two hundred dollars and thus a future instructor of ludwig von beethoven becomes established in bonn the records need not concern us now until we reach the following which forms part of the history of the grandfather of the subject of this biography march seventeen thirty three decretum for ludovicum von beethoven as electoral court musician c l a whereas his serene highness elector of cologne duke clemens august in upper and lower bavaria etc our gracious lord having on the humble petition of ludovico von beethoven graciously declared and received him as court musician and assigned him an annual salary of four hundred florins rhenish the present decree under the gracious hand of his serene electoral highness and the seal of the privy chancellor is granted to him electoral counsellor and paymaster rissac is herewith commanded to pay the said beethoven the four hundred florin quartalite from the beginning of this year and to make a proper accounting thereof b march seventeen thirty three thirteen years later we find this allowance of an additional one hundred dollars annually to the chamber musician von beethoven inasmuch as his serene highness elector of cologne duke clement august of upper and lower bavaria our most gracious lord has increased the salary of his chamber musician von beethoven by the addition of one hundred dollars annually which became due through the death of joseph kaiser instrument maker the court chamber counsellor and paymaster rissac is hereby informed and graciously commanded to pay to him the said beethoven the one hundred florins a year in quarterly instalments against voucher from the proper time and to make the proper accounting witness etc poppelsdorf august the twenty second seventeen forty six on may the second seventeen forty seven johann rees became court trumpeter with a salary of one hundred and ninety two dollars this is the first representative we have met of a name which afterwards rose to great distinction not only in the orchestra of the elector but also in the world at large on march the fifth seventeen fifty four he was formally appointed court musician violinist having set forth in his petition that instead of confining himself to the trumpet he had made himself serviceable in the chapel by singing and playing other instruments later he took ill and was sent to cologne we shall presently meet his two daughters and his son franz rees the last of whom will figure prominently in the life history of beethoven under date march the twenty seventh seventeen fifty six occur several papers which have a double interest they relate to the beethoven family and are so complete as to exhibit the entire process of appointment to membership in the electoral chapel the original documents are not calculated to give the reader a very exalted idea of the orthographical knowledge of the petitioner or the chamber music director gottwald but that fault gives us the clue to the correct pronunciation of the name beethoven the english beet garden to his electoral serenity of cologne etc my most gracious lord the humble petition and prayer of joan von beethoven most revered most serene elector most gracious lord lord etc may it please your electoral serenity graciously to hear the humble representations how in the absence of voices in your highness's court chapel my insignificant self took part in the music for at least four years without the good fortune of having allotted by your serene electoral highness a small salario i therefore pray your serene electoral highness most humbly that it graciously please you 
in consideration of my father's faithful service for twenty-three years to rejoice me with a decree as court musician which high grace will infuse me with zeal to serve your serene highness with the greatest fidelity and zealousness your serene electoral highness's most humble obedient faithful servant johann von Beethoven. to the music director gottwald for a report of his humble judgment attestation by the most gracious sign manual and seal of the privy chancellery bonn march the nineteenth seventeen fifty six signed clemens august l s most reverend most serene elector most gracious lord lord etc your serene electoral highness has referred to my humble judgment the petition of johann von pietofen the supplicant prays your electoral highness for a gracious decree as accessus in the court music he has indeed served for two years with his voice on the duke sal doxel hopes in time to deserve the goodwill of your serene highness by his industry and his father who enjoys the grace of serving your highness as bass singer prays his appointment i pray most humbly and obediently for instruction concerning your highness's goodwill in the matter submit myself humbly and obediently to your serene highness's grace and remain in greatest humility your serene and electoral highnesses most humble and obedient servant gottwald director of the chamber music a further report was made to the elector as follows bonn march the twenty seventh seventeen fifty six coloniensis gratiosa chamber music director gottwald ad supplicam of johann von Beethoven has served two years on the doxel and hopes through his industry to serve further to the satisfaction of your electoral highness to which end his father who through your highness's grace serves as bass singer will seek completely to qualify him which may it please your serene highness to allow item gottwald ad supplicum ernest havecus accessist in the court music reports that suppliant though not fully capable as yet hopes by special diligence to make himself worthy of your highness's service and would be encouraged and rejoiced in his efforts if your serene highness would graciously deign to grant him a decreto humbly praying to be informed as to your highness's wishes in the matter decretum court musicians decree for johann von beethoven c l m a where is his serene electoral highness of cologne duke clement august in upper and lower bavaria etc our gracious lord on the humble petition of johann von beethoven and in consideration of his skill in the art of singing also the experience in the same already gained having graciously declared and accepted him as court musician appoint and accept him by this writing therefore the said beethoven receives this decree with the gracious sign manual and seal of the privy chancellery and those who are concerned to recognize him hereafter as an electoral court musician and to pay him such respect as the position deserves bonn march the twenty fifth seventeen fifty six johann von beethoven was sixteen years old at this time why he should appear in the court calendar as an accessus four years after the publication of this decree appointing him court musician does not appear but slender success has rewarded the search for means of determining the character and quality of that opera and music upon which according to ennin clemens august lavished such large sums the period embraced in that elector's rule seventeen twenty four to seventeen sixty one was precisely that in which the old italian opera the oratorio and the sacred cantata reached their extreme limits of development through the genius of handel and j s bach it closes at the moment when gluck c p e bach and joseph haydn were laying the immovable foundations of a new operatic orchestral and pianoforte music and before the perfected sonata form that found universal adoption in all compositions of the better class not vocal little music comparatively was issued from the press in those days and consequently new forms and new styles made their way slowly into vogue another consequence was that the offices of composer for the chamber the church the comedy or however they were named were by no means sinecures neither at the imperial court of maria theresia nor at the court of any petty prince or noble whose servants formed his orchestra composers had to furnish music on demand and as often as was necessary as the hunter delivered game or the fisherman fished what a volume of music was produced in this manner can be seen in the case of joseph haydn at esterhatz whose fruitfulness did not in all probability exceed that of many another of his contemporaries the older telemann furnished compositions to the courts of beirut and eisenach 
as well as the gray friars at frankfort on the main and also performed his duties as musical director and composer at hamburg he wrote music with such ease that as handel said he could write for eight voices as rapidly as an ordinary man could write a letter under such conditions did the men write who are mentioned as official composers in our narrative it is probable that not a note of theirs remains in existence and equally probable that the loss is not at all deplorable except as it leaves the curiosity of an antiquary unsatisfied a few textbooks to vocal pieces performed on various occasions during this reign have been preserved their titles being componimento per musica music by giuseppe dal abaco director of the chamber of music seventeen forty la morte d'abel no date is given but il signor beethoven sang the part of adamo esther from the italian of s f a albert the text partly in german partly in italian anna gilda drama per musica end of section one section two of the life of ludwig von beethoven volume one by alexander wheelock thayer translated by henry edward crabiel this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one part two after the unlucky ball at aaron breitstein the crook and sceptre of cologne passed from the bavarian family which had so long held them into the hands of maximilian friedrich of the swabian line Königsegg or Königsegg rothenfels for a century or more this house had enjoyed fat livings in the church at cologne in which city the new elector was born on may thirteenth seventeen o eight he was the fourth of his race who had held the important office of dean of the cathedral from which post he was elevated to the electorship on april sixth seventeen sixty one and to the ecclesiastical principality of munster the next year with which to seize he was fain to be content he was by nature an easy good-tempered indolent friendly man of no great force of character qualities which in the incumbent of a rich sinecure just completing his fifty-third year would be too fully confirmed and developed by habit to change with any change of circumstances and which says stromberg made him unusually popular throughout the land despite the familiar little verse by clemens auguste trug man blau und weiss de lebte man wie im paradies by max friedrich trug man sich schwarz und roth da litt man hunger wie die Svernoth. the condition of the finances had become such through the extravagant expenditures of clemens auguste that very energetic measures were necessary and to the effects of these during the first few years of max friedrich's rule in throwing many persons out of employment these doggerel lines doubtless owe their origin it was fortunate for the elector's subjects that his indolence was made good by the activity and energy of a prime minister who found his beau ideal of a statesman in frederick the second of prussia whom in his domestic policy he imitated as far as the character of the two governments allowed this was equally if not more true in the principality of munster to the respect which one must feel for the memory of belderbusch the all-powerful minister at bonn is added in the case of fürstenberg the equally powerful minister at munster admiration and regard for the man the former was respected feared but not loved in the electorate the latter was respected and very popular in the principality to caspar anton von belderbusch the new elector owed his elevation to his care he entrusted the state to his skill and strength of character he was indebted for release 
from the pecuniary difficulties which beset him and for the satisfaction as the years rolled by of seeing his states numbered among the most prosperous and flourishing in germany belderbush's first care was to reduce the expenditure he put a stop to building says ennin dismissed a number of the actors restricted the number of concerts and court balls dispensed with the costly hunts reduced the salaries of court officials officers and domestics lessened the etat for the kitchen cellar and table of the prince turned the property left by clemens august into money and comforted the latter's creditors with the hope of better times but though economy was the rule still where the elector considered it due to his position he could be lavish whatever opinions may be entertained as to the wisdom and expediency of clothing ecclesiastics with civil power it would be unjust not to give the bright as well as the dark side of the picture this is well put by caspar risbeck in relation to the rhenish states whose princes were churchmen and his remarks are in place here since they relate in part to that in which the childhood and youth of beethoven were spent the whole stretch of the country from here to mayence is one of the richest and most populous in germany within this territory of eighteen german miles there are twenty cities lying hard by the shore of the rhine and dating for the greater part from the period of the romans it is still plainly to be seen that this portion of germany was the first to be built up neither morasses nor heaths interrupt the evidences of cultivation which stretch with equal industry far from the shores of the river over the contiguous country while many cities and castles built under charlemagne and his successors especially henry i and other parts of germany have fallen into decay all in this section have not only been preserved but many have been added to them the natural wealth of the soil in comparison with that of other lands and the easy disposition of its products by means of the rhine have no doubt contributed most to these results nevertheless great as is the prejudice in germany against the ecclesiastical governments they have beyond doubt aided in the blooming development of these regions in the three ecclesiastical electorates which make up the greater part of this tract of land nothing is known of those tax burdens under which the subjects of so many secular princes of germany groan these princes have exceeded the old assessments but slightly little is known in their countries of serfdom the appanage of many princes and princesses do not force them to extortion they have no inordinate military institution and do not sell the sons of their farmers and they have never taken so active a part in the domestic and foreign wars of germany as the secular princes though they are not adept in encouraging their subjects in art culture buried agriculture has been developed to a high degree of perfection throughout the region nature does of its own accord what laws and regulations seek to compel as soon as the rocks of offence are removed from the path henry swinburne whose letters to his brother were published long after his death under the title of the courts of europe writes under date of november twenty ninth seventeen eighty bonn is a pretty town neatly built and its streets tolerably well paved all in black lava it is situated in a flat near the river the elector of cologne's palace faces the south entry it has no beauty of architecture and is all plain white without any pretensions we went to court and were invited to dine with the elector Koenigsegg. he is seventy-three years old a little hale black man very merry and affable his table is none of the best no dessert wines handed about nor any foreign wines at all he is easy and agreeable having lived all his life in ladies company which he is said to have liked better than his breviary the captains of his guard and a few other people of the court form the company amongst whom were his two great nieces madame de hatzfeld and madame de taxis the palace is of immense size the ballroom particularly large and low the elector goes about to all the assemblies and plays at trick track he asked me to be of his party but i was not acquainted with their way of playing 
there is every evening an assembly or play at court the elector seems very strong and healthy and will i think hold the archduke a good tug yet this archduke was max franz youngest son of maria theresia whose acquaintance swinburne had made in vienna and who had just been chosen coadjutor to max friedrich a curious proof of the liberality not to say laxity of the elector's sentiments in one direction is given by stromberg in his rhinischer antiquarius to wit the possession of a mistress in common by him and his minister belderbush the latter fathering the children and this mistress was the countess caroline von satzenhofen abbess of village the reduction which was made by belderbush upon the accession of max friedrich in the expenses of the theatre and other amusements does not appear except in the case of the chapel-master to have extended to the court music proper nor to have been long continued in respect to the operetta and comedy the first in order of the documents and notices discovered relating to the musical establishment of this elector are of no common interest being the petition of a candidate for the vacant office of chapel-master and the decree appointing him to that position they are as follows very reverend archbishop and elector most gracious lord lord may it please your electoral grace to permit a representation of my faithfully and dutifully performed services for a considerable space as vocalist as well as since the death of the chapel-master for more than a year his duties in duplo that is to say by singing and wielding the baton concerning which my demand still remains odd referendum much less have i been assured of the position inasmuch as because of particular recommendation douce moulin was preferred over me and indeed unjustly i have been forced hitherto to submit to fate but now gracious elector and lord that because of the reduction in salaries chapel-master douce moulin has already asked his demission or will soon do so and i at the command of baron belderbush am to begin de novo to fill his office and the same must surely be replaced therefore there reaches your electoral grace my humble petition that you may graciously be pleased inasmuch as the toxel must be sufficiently supplied with music and i must at all events take the lead in the occurring church ceremonies in puncto the chorales to grant me the justice of which i was deprived on the death of your highness's antecessory of blessed memory and appoint me chapel-master with some augmentation of my lessened salary because of my services performed in duplo for which highest grace i shall pour out my prayers to god for the long continuing health and government of your electoral grace while in deepest submission i throw myself at your feet your electoral grace's most humble servant ludwig von beethoven passist m f whereas we maximilian friedrich elector of cologne on the demission of our former chapel-master touchemelin and the humble petition of our base singer ludwig von beethoven have appointed the latter to be chapel-master with the retention of his position as base singer and have added ninety seven reichsthaler species forty alb to his former salary of two hundred and ninety two reichsthaler species forty alb per annum divided in quartalian which appointment is hereby made in payment ordered by our grace our exchequer and all whom it may concern are called on to observe the fact and do what is required under the circumstances attest etc bond july sixteen seventeen sixty one next in order at an interval of rather more than a year is the following short paper in reply to a petition not preserved of the new chapel-master's son suppla canton is hereby graciously assured that in the event of a vacatur of a court musician's salary he shall have special consideration attest our gracious sign manual and the impress of the seal of the privy chancellery max fried elector v Belder Bush, L. S. Bond, November twenty seventh, seventeen sixty two. About December seventeen sixty three, a singer, Madame Lentner, after some four and a half years of service, threw up her appointment 
giving occasion through the vacancy thus caused for the following petition report and decrees most reverend elector most gracious lord lord will your electoral grace deign to receive the representation that by the acceptance of service elsewhere of court musician dauber there has fallen to the disposition of your reverend electoral grace a salary of one thousand fifty reichthaler wherefore i johannes von beethoven having graciously been permitted for a considerable time to serve as court musician and have been graciously assured by decree of appointment to the first vacancy and have always faithfully and diligently performed my duties and graciously been permitted to be in good voice therefore my prayer is made to your reverend and electoral grace for a grant of the aforesaid one thousand fifty reichthaler or a gracious portion thereof which act of highest grace i shall try to merit by fidelity and zeal in the performance of my duties your reverend electoral grace's most obedient servant johannes von beethoven vocalist this petition was seconded by the father in the following manner most reverend archbishop and elector most gracious lord lord your electoral grace having graciously been pleased to submit for my humble report the humble petition of your highness's court musician johann rees that his daughter be appointed to the place in the court music of your highness made vacant by the discharged soprano nutner sublit a humbly obeying your gracious command i submit an impartial report that for about a year the daughter of the court musician rees has frequented the duke saw doxel and sung the soprano part and that to my satisfaction but now that my son johannes von beethoven has already for thirteen years sung soprano contralto and tenor in every emergency that has arisen on the duke saw is also capable on the violin wherefore your reverend electoral grace twenty seven november seventeen sixty two granted the accompanying decree graciously bearing your own high sign manual sublet b my humble and obedient but not anticipatory opinion is that the court singer lentner's vacated salary odd three hundred florins who went away without the gracious permission of your highness over a quarter of a year ago and reported to me in specie she was going without permission and would not return be graciously divided so that my son be decreed to receive two hundred florins and the daughter of court musician rees one hundred florins zu ihr zur first gnaden bestradige halden und gnaden muck unter thagnigst el lasant in tiefester sumissen esterba your reverend elector grace's most humble and obedient ludwig von beethoven chapel master increase of salary of one hundred reichsthaler for court musician beethoven m f whereas we maximilian frederick elector of cologne on the humble petition of our court musician johann von beethoven have shown him the grace to allow him a hundred reichthaler out of the salary vacated by the departure of the singer lentner to be paid annually in quartalian we hereby confirm the allowance for which this decree is graciously promulgated to be observed by our electoral exchequer which is to govern itself accordingly attest p bonn april twenty four seventeen sixty four under the same date a decree was issued appointing anna maria rees daughter of johann rees court singer with a salary of one hundred thaler also out of that of the lentner a few days later the following action was taken m f e to the electoral exchequer touching the appointment of court musician beethoven and the singer rees you are hereby graciously informed that our court musician beethoven jr and the singer rees will soon lay before you two decrees of, of appointment now inasmuch as with this the salary of the former singer lentner is disposed of but since she received an advance of thirty seven and a half reichthaler from our master of revenues and eighteen reichthaler spes was paid to her creditors we graciously command you herewith so to arrange the payment of the two salaries that the advance from the revenues and then the payment to the creditors be covered from the lentner's salary and that until this is done the salaries of the before-mentioned rees and beethoven do not begin we etc bonn april twenty seventh seventeen sixty four on april three seventeen seventy eight anna maria rees received an additional one hundred florins a few more documents lead us to the family of johann peter solomon ad supplicam philip solomon 
to inform our chapel-master van beethoven appointed on his humble petition that we are not minded to grant the letter prayed for to the prince versus selkowski but in case his son is not returned by the beginning of the coming month eight bris we are graciously determined to make disposition of his place and salary attest munster august eighth seventeen sixty four sent the twenty two ditto in spite of this order on july one seventeen sixty five the elector gave a document to the son johann peter salomon certifying that he had served him faithfully and diligently and had so conducted himself as to deserve to be recommended to every one according to his station on petition of philip salomon the father he and his daughter were appointed court musicians by decree dated august eleventh seventeen sixty four several papers dated april twenty sixth seventeen sixty eight although upon matters of very small importance have a certain interest as being in part official communications from the pen of chapel-master van beethoven and illustrating in some measure his position and duties they show too that his path was not always one bordered with roses being self-explanatory they require no comment one most reverend archbishop and elector most gracious lord lord will your electoral grace deign to listen to the complaint that when court singer schwachhofer was commanded in obedience to an order of his excellency baron von belderbusch to alternate with jacobina salomon in the singing of the solos in the church music as is the custom the said schwachhofer in the presence of the entire chapel impertinently and literally answered me as follows i will not accept your order and you have no right to command me your electoral grace will doubtless recall various disorder on the part of the court chapel indicating that all respect and ordinance is withheld from me each member behaving as he sees fit which is very painful to my sensibilities wherefore my humble prayer reaches your electoral highness that the public affront of the schwachhofer be punished to my deserved satisfaction and that a decree issue from your highness to the entire chapel that at the cost of your gracious displeasure or punishment according to the offence my order shall not be evaded your electoral gracious humble and most obedient servant ludovicus von beethoven two to chapel master von beethoven concerning the court musicians m f e receive the accompanying command to the end that its contents be conveyed to all of our court musicians or be posted on the toxel we remain etc bon april twenty sixth seventeen sixty eight three command respecting the court musicians having learned with displeasure that several of our court musicians have tried to evade the order issued by our chapel master or refused to receive them from him and conduct themselves improperly amongst themselves all of our court musicians are hereby earnestly commanded without contradiction to obey all the commands given by our chapel-master in our name and bear peaceful relations with each other since we are determined to proceed with rigour against the guilty to the extent of dismissal in certain cases sig bon april twenty sixth seventeen sixty eight on november seventeenth seventeen sixty nine johann von beethoven submits a petition in which he exhibits anew his genius for devising methods for varying the spelling of his own name that he could no longer live on one hundred thaler salary is evident when it is remembered that he has now been married two years but as there were several applicants for the salary which had fallen to the disposal of the elector it was divided among the four most needy beethoven's memorial contains a fact or two in regard to his duties as court musician which are new to his electoral grace of cologne etc etc the humble supplication and prayer of johann beethoff court musician most reverend archbishop and elector most gracious lord lord may your most reverend electoral grace graciously permit the presentation of this humble supplicando how for many years i have served your highness faithfully and industriously on the duke sal and the theatre and also have given instruction in various subjecta concerning the aforesaid service to the entire satisfaction of your electoral grace and am engaged now in study to perfect myself to this end my father also joins in this supplic in his humble capacity of the theatre 
and will participate in the gladness should your electoral grace graciously grant the favour as it is impossible for me to live on the salary of one hundred thaler graciously allowed me i pray your electoral grace to bestow upon me the hundred thaler left at your gracious disposal by the death of your court musician philip havoc to merit this high grace by faithful and diligent service shall be my greatest striving your electoral grace is most humble johannes batoff court musician in answer to this there came the following decree whereas we max fried p on the death of court musician philip havoc and the submissive petition of our court musician philip solomon bestowed upon him the grace of adding fifty florins for his two daughters to the salary which he already enjoys out of the salary of the above-mentioned havoc per year we confirm the act hereby wherefore we have graciously issued this decree which our electoral court exchequer will humbly observe and make all necessary provisions attest p munster seventeenth nine bris seventeen sixty nine on the margin gracious addition of fifty florins for the court musician philip solomon and besides brandt and muris also in simuli for court musician johann betoff twenty five florins there need be no apologies for filling a few more pages with extracts from documents found in the dusseldorf archives for now a period has been reached in which the child ludwig von beethoven is growing up into youth and early manhood and thrown into constant contact with those whose names will appear some of these names will come up many years later in vienna others will have their parts to play in the narrative of that child's life omitting for the present a petition of johann von beethoven we begin then with that of joseph demmer of date january twenty three seventeen seventy three which first secured him his appointment after a year's service and three months instruction from the young mr von beethoven most reverend archbishop and elector most gracious lord etc etc i have been accepted as chorister in the cathedral of this city at a salary of eighty thaler per year and have so practised myself in music that i humbly flatter myself of my ability to perform my task with the highest satisfaction it being graciously known that the bass singer von beethoven is incapacitated and can no longer serve as such and the contra bassist Neusten cannot adapt his voice therefore this my submissive to your reverend electoral grace that you graciously be pleased to accept me as your bass singer with such gracious salary as may seem fit i offer should it be demanded to attend the operettas also and qualify myself in a short time it depends upon a mere hint from your electoral grace alone that it shall not be burdensome to the cantor's office of the cathedral to save the loss of the eighty thaler yearly which it has bestowed upon me i am in most dutiful reverence your electoral grace's most obedient joseph demmer pro memoria cantor demmer earned at the utmost one hundred and six reich thaler per year if he neglected none of the greater or little horries pays the chamber chancellor kuglengen for board annually sixty six reich thaler for cartier lodging twelve reich thaler moreover he must find himself in clothes and washing since his father the sub sacristan in cologne is still overburdened with six children he is paid six reich thaler to young mr beethoven for three months in response to another petition after the death of l van beethoven the following decree was issued decree as court vocal base for joseph demmer whereas his electoral grace of cologne m f our most gracious lord on the humble petition of joseph demmer has graciously appointed and accepted him as his highness's vocal base on the electoral toxel with a yearly salary of two hundred florins divided in quartalian to begin with the current time the appointment is confirmed hereby and a decree granted to the same demmer of which for purposes of payment the electoral chancellery will take notice and all whom it may concern will respect and obey the same and otherwise do what is necessary in the premises attest p bond may twenty nine seventeen seventy four two years later leave of absence but without salary was granted to joseph demmer to visit amsterdam to complete his education in music 
further notes from documentary sources seventeen seventy four may twenty six andreas lucchesi appointed court chapel master in place of ludwig von beethoven deceased with a salary of one thousand florins may twenty nine salary of anna maria rees raised from two hundred and thirty florins to three hundred florins on may thirteenth seventeen seventy five together with ferdinand truer drewer violinist she receives leave of absence for four months to begin in june with two quarters pay in advance in the court calendar for seventeen seventy five which was printed about seven months in advance she is already described as madame drewer's nay rees she was considered the best singer in the chapel november twenty three franz anton rees has granted him twenty five thaler payable quarterly seventeen seventy five march twenty three nicholas simrock appointed on petition court hornist on the electoral toxel in the cabinet and at table and a salary of three hundred florins was granted april one this is the first appearance in these records of a name which afterwards rose into prominence seventeen seventy seven april twenty b j mower violoncellist who has served in the court chapel from the beginning of the year till now on a promise of one hundred thaler prays for an appointment as court cellist at a salary of four hundred thaler appointed at a salary of two hundred thaler we shall have occasion to recur to him presently in connection with notices touching beethoven under date may twenty two seventeen seventy eight j von beethoven informs the elector that the singer aver donk who is to be sent to chapel master solace at coblenz is to pay fifteen florins per month for board and lodging but that only a douceur is to be asked for her instruction and that to take her thither will cost twenty thaler there followed upon this the following document to the humble announcement of court musician beethoven touching the singer Averdonk, electoral counsellor for levisi is to pay to the proper authorities for a year beginning next month fifteen florins a month and for the travelling expenses twenty reichthaler once and for all as soon as the journey is begun attest p bond may twenty two seventeen seventy eight this pupil of johann von beethoven johanna helena Averdonk, born in bonn on december eleventh seventeen sixty and brought forward by her teacher at a concert in cologne received one hundred and twenty thaler as a special grace on july two and was appointed court singer on november eighteenth seventeen eighty with a salary of two hundred thaler she died nine years later august thirteenth seventeen eighty nine the petitions sent in to the elector were rarely dated and were not always immediately attended to therefore the date of a decretum is not to be taken as conclusive in regard to the date of facts mentioned in a petition an illustration is afforded by a petition of franz rees he has returned from a tour to vienna and prays for a salary of five hundred florins not the half of what he can earn elsewhere the petition is dated march two two months passing without bringing him an answer he petitions again and obtains a decree on may two that in addition to his salary of twenty eight thaler to alb six he shall receive a knock so veal again as much that is four hundred florins seventeen eighty august court organist van den ida prays that in consideration of his service of fifty-four years he be graciously and charitably given the salary vacated by the death of court musician salomon eighteen others make the same prayer the decision of the privy council is in these words to be divided between huttonus and esch a decree as musical vocalist must first be given to the latter seventeen eighty one february fifteen the name of c g nefa is now met with for the first time he petitions for appointment to the position of organist in succession to van den ida obviously aged and infirm a decree was issued placid expediatur on the death of organist van den ida and a salary of four hundred florins granted seventeen eighty two may sixteen johann von beethoven petitions for the three measures malter of corn the archives of dusseldorf furnish little more during the time of max friedrich save certain papers relating to the beethoven family which are reserved for another place the search for means to form some correct idea of the character of the musical performances at the elector's court during this reign has been more successful than for the preceding 
but much is left to be desired down to the year seventeen seventy eight when the theatre was placed upon a different basis and its history is sufficiently recorded such notices however in relation to the operatic entertainments as have been found scattered mostly in the newspapers of bonn in those years are numerous enough to give an idea of their character while the remarks upon the festivities of the court connected with them afford a pretty lively picture of social amusement in the highest circle we make room for some of the most significant occurrences in chronological order seventeen sixty four january three galuppi's opera il filosofo di campagna given in the electoral theatre with great applause january eight a grand assembly at the palace in the afternoon a magnificent supper in the grand gallery at which many spectators were present and finally a masked ball march twenty three second performance of la buona figliuola music by piccini may thirteen elector's birthday le nozze music by galuppi and two ballets may twenty il filosofo again the notice of which is followed by the remark that the elector is about removing to brule for the summer but will visit bonn twice a week on the days when operas are performed september twenty one la pastorella al soglio composer not named probably latilla and two ballets december sixteen la calamita di Curi by galuppi and two ballets this was the first performance by the mingotti company under the direction of rizzi and romanini seventeen sixty five january sixth la aventure di rodolfo piccini given by the same company together with a pantomime larla quino for tonato per la magia after the play there was a grand supper at which the pope's nuncio was a guest and finally a mass ball kept up till six o'clock in the morning seventeen sixty seven may thirteen the archbishop's birthday here is the programme condensed from the long description of the festivities in the bonisher and zeiger one early in the morning three rounds from the cannon on the city walls two the court and public graciously permitted to kiss his transparency's hand three solemn high mass with salvos of artillery four grand dinner in public the pope's nuncio the foreign ministers and the nobility being the guests and the eating being accompanied by exquisite table music five after dinner a numerously attended assembly six a serenata composed especially for this most joyful day and a comic opera in the palace theatre seven supper of a hundred and thirty covers eight bal masque until five a m the two dramatic pieces were serenata festivale tra bacco diana ed il reno the authors unnamed and schiava finta drama giocoso dal celebre don francesco garcia bragunuola the music probably by piccini giovanni von beethoven sang the part of dorindo seventeen sixty eight may sixteen on the stage of the court theatre was performed with much applause a musical poem in german specially written for the birthday of his highness and afterward in italian intermezzo entitled la nobilta de lusa seventeen sixty nine the festivities in honour of the birthday of the elector took place may seventeenth when according to the anzeiger an italian musical drama written expressly for this occasion was performed but the title suggests the possibility of a mistake il riso da Pauline, with music by betz had been heard in seventeen o one seventeen seventy one a single discovery only for this year has rewarded search that of a textbook one of particular interest sylvain comedie en un acte mille d'ari et representé etc text by mar montel music by gentry dolman pere mont louis van beethoven maitre de chapelle dolman fils aîné jean van beethoven etc seventeen seventy two february twenty seven le don sans prodan music by andreas lucchesi in march on occasion of the opening of the estates la contandine and court music by sacchini the pieces given on the birthday this year were il natale di giove music by lucchesi and la buona figliuola music by piccini on the seventeenth the latter was repeated on the arrival of the french ambassador seventeen seventy three may thirty the elector's birthday langano scoperto o vero il conte caramella music by lucchesi in which ludovico von beethoven sang the part of brunoro catandino e tamburino there are three more operettas which evidently belong to the succeeding winter 
when the bonne company have the aid of two singers from the electoral courts of treves their titles are lamprovisata o sia la galanteria disturbata by lucchese li tre amanti ridicoli by galuppi and la moda by baroni ludwig van beethoven did not sing in them the means are still wanting to fill up the many gaps in the annals of this period or to carry them on during the next three years perhaps however the loss is not of much importance for the materials collected are sufficient to warrant certain conclusions in regard to the general character of the court music the musicians both vocal and instrumental were employed in the church concert room and theatre their number remained without material change from the days of christopher petz to the close of chapelmaster von beethoven's life places in this service were held to be a sort of heritage and a right due to the children of old incumbents when possessed of sufficient musical talent and knowledge few of any names of distinguished virtuosos are found in the lists of the members and in all probability the performances never rose above the respectable mediocrity of a small band used to playing together in the light and pleasing music of the day the dramatic performances appear to have been confined to the operetta and the vocalists who sang the latin of the mass seem to have been required to be equally at home in german italian and french in the theatre two visits of the angelo mingotti troop are noted and one attempt at least to place the opera upon a higher basis by the engagement of italian songstresses was evidently made in the time of clemens auguste it may be concluded that no great improvement was made it is certain that no permanent one was for in the other case the bond theatrical revolution of seventeen seventy eight had not been needed this must be noticed in detail chronologically the following sketch belongs to the biography of ludwig von beethoven as it embraces a period which happens in his case to be of special interest young as he was the period from his eighth to his fourteenth year but the details given though of great importance for the light which they throw upon the musical life in which he moved and acted would hardly be of so much interest to most readers as to justify breaking with them the course of the future narrative End of chapter one part two section three of the life of ludwig von beethoven volume one by alexander wheelock thayer translated by henry edward Krebiel. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one part three it was a period of great awakening in theatrical matters princes and courts were beginning everywhere in germany to patronize the drama of their mother tongue and the labors of lessing goddard and other well-known names in the original production of german were in the translation of the best english italian and french plays were justifying and giving ever new impulse to the change in taste from the many itinerant troops of players performing in booths where in the larger cities and the playhouses the better class of actors were slowly finding their way into permanent companies engaged and supported by the governments true many of the newly established court theatres had but a short and not always a very merry life true also that the more common plan was merely to afford aid and protection to some itinerant troop still the idea of a permanent national theatre on the footing of the already long existing court musical establishments had made way and had already been carried out in various places before it was taken up by the elector at bonn it can hardly be supposed that the example of the imperial court at vienna with the immense means at its disposal could exert any direct influence upon the small court at bonn at the other extremity of germany but what the duke of gotha and the elector of at mannheim had undertaken in this direction max friedrich may well have ventured and determined to imitate but there was an example nearer home in fact in his own capital of munster where he the prince primate usually spent the summer in seventeen seventy five dobler's troop which had been for some time playing in that city was broken up the westless brothers in munster built up their own out of the ruins but it endured only a short time thereupon under the care of the minister h von furstenberg one of those rare men whom heaven elects and equips with all necessary gifts 
to cultivate what is good and beautiful in the arts a meeting of the lovers of the stage was arranged in may and a few gentlemen of the nobility and a few from the parterre formed a council which assumed the direction the elector makes a considerable contribution the money otherwise received is to be applied to the improvement of the wardrobe and the theatre the actors receive their honoraria every month at easter seventeen seventy seven sailor a manager famous in german theatrical annals and then at dresden finding himself unable to compete with his rival bondini left that city with his company to try his fortunes in frankfort on the main mayence and other cities in that quarter the company was very large the theatre lexicon article mainz makes it including its orchestra amount to two hundred and thirty individuals much too large it seems in spite of the assertion of the theatre lexicon to be profitable be that as it may after an experience of a year or more two of the leading members grossmann and helmuth accepted an engagement from max friedrich to form and manage a company at bonn in order that the german art of acting might be raised to a school of morals and manners for his people taking with them a pretty large portion of sailors company including several of the best members the managers reached bonn and were ready upon the elector's return from munster to open a season the opening of the theatre took place says the bonn dramaturgiska nachrichten on the twenty sixth of november seventeen seventy eight with a prologue spoken by madame grossmann wilhelmine blondheim tragedy in three acts by grossmann and e grossa battery comedy in one act by aaron hoffer the same authority gives a list of all the performances of the season which extended to the thirtieth of may seventeen seventy nine together with debuts the dismissals and other matters pertaining to the actors the number of the evenings on which the theatre was open was fifty a five-act play as a rule occupied the whole performance but of shorter pieces usually two were given and thus an opening was found occasionally for an operetta of musical dramas only seven came upon the stage and these somewhat of the lightest order except the first the melodrama ariadne auf naxos music by benda the others were seventeen seventy nine february twenty one julie translated from the french by grossmann music by de Sides. february twenty eight die jager und das waldemarkchen operetta in what act music by duny march twenty one der hofs schmeid in two acts music by philidor april nine Rurschen und kolos in one act music by monsigny may five der fassbinder in one act music by oudinot may fourteen a prologue dedicated to the birthday festivities of his electoral grace of cologne may thirteenth seventeen seventy nine by j a freherrn vom hagen the selection of dramas was on the whole very creditable to the taste of the managers five of lessing's works among them mina von barnhelm and emilia galati are in the list and some of the best productions of bach goddard engel and their contemporaries of translations there were coleman's clandestine marriage angelus wife garrick's miss in her teens cumberland's west indian hoadley's suspicious husband voltaire's zaire and jeannette beaumarchais eugenie two or three of the works of moliere and goldoni etc in short the list presents much variety and excellence max friedrich was evidently pleased with the company for the knock richten has the following in the catalogue of performances on the eighth of april his electoral grace was pleased to give a splendid breakfast to the entire company in the theatre the company will occupy itself until the return of his electoral grace from munster which will be in the middle of november with learning the newest and best pieces among which are hamlet king lear and macbeth which are to be given also with much splendour of costume according to the designs of famous artists it may be remarked here that the bonn comedy house for painting the interior of which clemens auguste paid four hundred and sixty eight dollars in seventeen fifty one a date which seems to fix the time at which that end of the palace was completed 
occupy that portion of the present university archaeological museum room next the coblenz gate with large doors opening from the stage into the passageway so that this space could be used as an extension of the stage in pieces requiring it for the production of grand scenic effects above the theatre was the redoubtant saw of max franz's time the elector had of course an entrance from the passages of the palace into his box the door for the public in an angle of the wall now built up opened out upon the grove of horse-chestnuts the auditorium was necessarily low but spacious enough for several hundred spectators though much criticised by travellers as being unworthy so elegant a court not to say shabby it seems to have been a nice and snug little theatre meanwhile affairs with sailor were drawing to a crisis he had returned with his company from mannheim and reopened at frankfort august three seventeen seventy nine on the evening of the seventeenth to escape imprisonment as a bankrupt whether through his own fault or that of another the theatre lexicon affirms the latter case he took his wife and fled to mayence the company was allowed by the magistrates to play a few weeks with a view of earning at least the means of leaving the city but on october four its members began to separate benda and his wife went to berlin but c g neef the music director and opitz descended the rhine to bonn and joined the company there neef assuming temporarily the direction of the music in the theatre of which more in another place no record has been found of the repertory of the bonn theatre for the season seventeen seventy nine to seventeen eighty except that the opening piece on december three on the evening after the elector's return from munster was a prologue wir haben in wieder text by baron baumhagen with airs recitatives and choruses composed by neef that the desertur was in the list and finally hiller's jagged in june seventeen eighty one the season being over the company migrated to pyrmont from pyrmont to cassel and thence in october back to bonn the season of seventeen eighty one to eighty two was a busy one of musical dramas alone seventeen are reported as newly rehearsed from september seventeen eighty one to the same time in seventeen eighty two viz die liebe unter den handwerken l'amour artigiano music by gassmann robert und caliste music by guglielmi der alchemist music by schuster das tartariska gazette music by d'antoine of bonn der eifersuchtige liebhaber lamont jaloux music by great tree der hausfreund l'ami de la maison music by great tree die freundschaft auf der probe l'amitié à l'épreuve music by great tree Henrik und lieder music by neef die apotheke music by neef eigensinn und launen der liebe music by deller teller deller romeo and julie music by benda sophonisba declamation mit music music by neef lucille music by great tree milton und elmer music by mille or moule die samnitiska der malungsfire le mariage des samnites music by grey tree ernst und lucinda music by grey tree gunther von schwartzberg music by holzbauer it does not follow however that all these operas operettas and plays with music were produced during the season in bonn the company followed the elect to munster in june seventeen eighty two and removed thence to frankfort on the Main for its regular series of performances at michaelmas it came back to bonn in the autumn the season seventeen eighty two to eighty three was as active as the preceding some of the newly rehearsed spoken dramas were sir john falstaff from the english translations of sheridan's school for scandal shakespeare's lear and richard the third mrs cowley's who's the dupe and of original german plays schiller's fiesco and die rauber 
lessing's miss sarah sampson schroeder's testament etc etc the number of newly rehearsed musical dramas in which class are included such ballad operas as general burgoyne's maid of the oaks reached twenty these das rosenfest music by wolf of weimar azalea music by johann kuchler bassoonist in the bonn chapel die sklaven la schiava music by Pacini. zemir a azor music by ray tree das mud chen im eichthala maid of the oaks music by don tuan captain in the army of the elector of cologne der kaufmann von smyrna music by j a Just, court musician in the hague die seidenen schuhe music by alexander frizzer or fred zary die rue vor der tat music by de sidus de arme de tans music by j a hiller die olympischen spiele olympiad music by sacchini die lugnerin aus liebe music by salieri die italienerin zu london music by semarosa das gute madchen la buona figliuola music by piccini der antiquitaten sammler music by andre die effer prang aus dem surreal music by mozart die eifer sucked auf der probe il glosa in cemento music by anfossi rangstreit und eifer sucked auf dem lande le jalousie velan music by sarti und wer hoch kommt auf les les evenements am prévu music by graytree felix oder der findling felix ou l'enfant trouvé music by monsigny the pilgrima von mecca music by gluck but a still farther provision has been made for the elector's amusement during the season of seventeen eighty three to eighty four by the engagement of a ballet corps of eighteen persons the titles of five newly rehearsed ballets are given in the report from which the above particulars are taken and which may be found in the theatrical calendar for seventeen eighty four with an enlarged company and a more extensive repertory preparations were made for opening the theatre upon the elector's return at the end of october from munster to bonn but the relations of the company to the court have been changed let the theatre calendar describe the new position in which the stage at bonn was placed bonn his electoral grace by a special condescension had graciously determined to make the theatrical performances gratuitous and to that end has closed a contract with his highness's theatrical director grossmann according to which besides the theatre free of rent the illumination and the orchestra he is to receive an annual subvention for the maintenance of the company on his highness's command there will be two or three performances weekly by particular grace the director is permitted to spend several summer months in other places the advantages of this plan for securing a good repertory a good company and a zealous striving for improvement are obvious and its practical working during this its only season so far as can now be gathered from scanty records was a great success it will hereafter be seen that the boy ludwig von beethoven was often employed at the pianoforte at the rehearsals possibly also at the performances of the company of which neef was the musical director that a company consisting almost exclusively of performers who had passed the ordeal of frequent appearance on the stage and had been selected with full knowledge of the capacity of each and which moreover had gained so much success at the bond court as to be put upon a permanent footing must have been one of more than the ordinary average excellence at least in light opera needs no argument nor need comments be made upon the influence which daily intercourse with it and sharing in its labours especially in the direction of opera must have exerted upon the mind of a boy of twelve or thirteen years possessed of real musical genius the theatrical season and with it the company came to an untimely end belder bouche died in january seventeen eighty four madame grossmann died in childbed on march twenty eighth 
and on april fifteenth the elector followed them to another world after the death of the elector maximilian friedrich the court theatre was closed for the official mourning and the company dismissed with four weeks salary it is consonant to the plan of this introductory chapter that some space be devoted to sketches of some of the principal men whose names have already occurred and to some notes upon the musical amateurs of bonn who are known or may be supposed to have been friends of the boy beethoven these notices make no claim to the credit of being the result of original research they are except that of neef little more than extracts from a letter dated march two seventeen eighty three written by neef and printed in kramer's magazine der musique volume one pages three thirty seven and following at that time the capo director as neef calls him was cagetano mattioli born at venice august seventh seventeen fifty whose appointments were concertmaster and musical director in bonn made on may twenty sixth seventeen seventy four and april twenty fourth seventeen seventy seven he studied in parma says neef with the first violinist angelo morigi a pupil of tartini and in parma mantua and bologna conducted grand operas like orfeo alceste etc by the chevalier gluck with success he owed much to the example set by gluck in the matter of conducting it must be admitted that he is a man full of fire of lively temperament and fine feeling he penetrates quickly into the intentions of a composer and knows how to convey them promptly and clearly to the entire orchestra he was the first to introduce accentuation instrumental declamation careful attention to forte and piano or all the degrees of light and shade in the orchestra of this place in none of the qualifications of a leader is he second to the famed cannabich of mannheim he surpasses him in musical enthusiasm and like him insists upon discipline and order through his efforts the musical repertory of this court has been provided with a very considerable collection of good and admirable compositions symphonies masses and other works to which he makes daily additions in the same manner he is continually striving for the betterment of the orchestra just now he is engaged in a project for building a new organ for the court chapel the former organ a magnificent instrument became a prey of the flames of the great conflagration in the palace in seventeen seventy seven his salary is one thousand florins the chapel master appointed may twenty sixth seventeen seventy four was mr andrea lucchesi born may twenty eighth seventeen forty one at mata in venetian territory his teachers in composition were in the theatre style mr cocci of naples in the church style father Pao lucci a pupil of padre martini at bologna and afterwards mr saratelli chapel master of the duke of venice he is a good organist and occupied himself profitably with the instrument in italy he came here with mr mattioli as conductor of an italian opera company in seventeen seventy one taken altogether he is a light pleasing and gay composer whose part writing is cleaner than that of most of his countrymen in his church works he does not confine himself to the strict style affected by many to please amateurs neef enumerates lucchesi's compositions as follows nine works for the theatre among them the opera l'isola della fortuna seventeen sixty five il marito geloso seventeen sixty six le dun sempre dun il matrimonio per astuzia seventeen seventy one for venice and the two composed at bonn il natale di giove and langano scoperto various intermezzi and cantatas various masses vespers and other compositions for the church six sonatas for the pianoforte and violin a pianoforte trio four pianoforte quartets and several pianoforte concertos his salary was one thousand florins the organist of the court chapel was christian gottlob neef son of a poor tailor of chemnitz in saxony where he was born february five seventeen forty eight he is one of the many instances in musical history in which the career of the man is determined by the beauty of his voice in childhood at a very early age he became a chorister in the principal church which position gave him the best school and musical instruction that the small city afforded advantages so wisely improved as to enable him in early youth to gain a living by teaching at the age of twenty-one with twenty dollars in his pocket and a stipend of thirty dollars per annum from the magistrates of chemnitz 
he removed to leipzig to attend the lectures of the university and at that institution in the course of time he passed his examination in jurisprudence upon this occasion he argued the negative of the question has a father the right to disinherit a son for devoting himself to the theatre in chemnitz neef's teachers of music had been men of small talents and very limited acquirements and even in leipzig he owed more to his persevering study of the theoretical works of marpurg and c p e bach than to any regular instructor but there he had the very great advantage of forming an intimate acquaintance with and becoming an object of special interest to johann adam hiller the celebrated director of the gowandhaus concerts the then popular and famous composer the introducer of handel's messiah to the german public the industrious writer upon music and finally a successor of johann sebastian bach as cantor of the thomas school hiller gave him every encouragement in his power in his musical career opened the columns of his musical wachentelike nachrichten to his compositions and writings called him to his assistance in operatic composition gave him the results of his long experience in friendly advice criticised his compositions and at length in seventeen seventy seven gave him his own position as music director of sailors theatrical company then playing at the linkiska bod in dresden upon the departure of that troop for frankfort on the Main, neef was persuaded to remain with it in the same capacity he thus became acquainted with frau Zink, previously court singer at gotha but now engaged for sailor's opera the acquaintance ripened into a mutual affection and ended in marriage not long afterward it is no slight testimony to the high reputation which he enjoyed that at the moment of sailor's flight from frankfort seventeen seventy nine bondini whose success had driven that rival from dresden was in correspondence with neep and making him proposals to resign his position under sailor for a similar but better one in his service pending the result of these negotiations neef taking his wife with him temporarily joined grossmann and helmuth at bonn in the same capacity those managers who knew the value of his services from their previous experience as members of the sailor troop paid a very strong though involuntary tribute to his talents and personal character by adopting such unfair measures as to compel the musician to remain in bonn until bondini was forced to fill his vacancy by another candidate having once got him grossmann was determined to keep him and succeeded as long as the grossmann company remained undivided neef accompanied it in its annual visits to munster and other places thus the sketch of his life printed sixteen years later in the first volume of the allgemeine musikzeitung of leipzig bears date frankfurt on the main september thirtieth seventeen eighty two but from that period save perhaps for a short time in seventeen eighty three he seems not to have left bonn at all there were others besides grossmann and helmuth who thought neef too valuable an acquisition to the musical circles of bonn not to be secured less than a year and a half after his arrival there the minister belderbusk and the countess hatzfeld niece of the elector secured to him though a protestant an appointment to the place of court organist the salary of four hundred florins together with the seven hundred florins from grossmann made his income equal to that of the court chapel-master it is difficult now to conceive of the forgotten name of c g neef as having once stood high in the list of the first north german composers yet such was the case of neef's published compositions besides the short vocal and clavier pieces in hiller's periodical there had already appeared operettas in vocal score die apteca seventeen seventy two amors gukasten seventeen seventy two die einsprüche seventeen seventy three and heinrich und lieder seventeen seventy seven also airs composed for hiller's dorf barbier and one from his own republished opera zemir und eisler twelve odes of klopstock sharply criticised by forkel in his musikalische kritik bibliothek much to the benefit of the second edition of them and a pretty long series of songs of instrumental music he had printed twenty-four sonatas for pianoforte solo or with violin and from breitkopf and hartel's catalogue seven seventeen seventy two and seventeen seventy four may be added the following works included neither in his own list nor that of gerber a partita for string quartet two horns two oboes two flutes and two bassoons another for the same instruments minus the flutes and bassoons 
a third for the string quartet and two oboes only and two symphonies for a string quartet two horns two oboes and two flutes the symphonisba music was also finished and twenty years later after mozart had given a new standard of criticism it was warmly eulogized in the allgemeine musikzeitung of leipzig at the date of his letter to kramer march two seventeen eighty three he had added to his published work sex sonaten am klavier zu singen vada mecum für leibhaber des gesangs und klavier the klavier score of son of nispa and a concerto for clavier and orchestra his manuscripts he adds kramer's magazine one page three eighty two consist of a the scores of the operettas which had appeared in pianoforte arrangements b the score of his opera samira und azur c the score of his opera adelheit von Veltheim, d the score of a bardic song for the tragedy the romans in germany e the scores of theatrical between acts music f the score of a latin pater noster g various other smaller works he had in hand the composition of the operetta der neue gutscher the pianoforte score of which as also that of adelheit von Veltheim, was about to be published by dyck in leipzig a year before at a concert for amateurs at the house of mr von mastio he had produced an ode by klopstock dem unend lichen for four coarse voices in a large orchestra which was afterwards performed in holy week in the Fraulein stiff skirka in short neef brought to bonn a high-sounding reputation talent skill and culture both musical and literary which made him invaluable to the managers when new french and italian operas were to be prepared for the german stage great facility in throwing off a new air song entre acht or what not to meet the exigencies of the moment very great industry a scribendi of the very highest value to the student of bond's musical history in his time and a new element into the musical life there this element may have seemed somewhat formal and pedantic but it was solid for it was drawn from the school of handel and bach let us return to neef's letter to kramer again for some notices of music outside the electoral palace belderbush the minister retained a quintet of wind instruments two clarinets two horns and a bassoon the countess von belderbusch wife of a nephew of the minister whose name will come up again plays skilfully upon the clavier the countess von hatzfeld niece of the elector was trained in singing and clavier playing by the best masters of vienna to whom indeed she does very much honour she declaims recitatives admirably and it is a pleasure to listen to her sing arias di parlante she plays the forte piano brilliantly and in playing yields herself up completely to her emotions wherefore one never hears any restlessness or unevenness of time in her tempo rubato she is enthusiastically devoted to music and musicians chancellor and captain von schall plays clavier and violin though not adept on either instrument he has very correct musical feeling he knows how to appreciate the true beauties of a composition and how to judge them and has large historical and literary knowledge of music frau court councillor von belzer plays the clavier and sings she has a strong masculine contralto of wide range particularly downwards johann gottfried von mastio of the finance department an incumbent of divers high offices as a self-taught musician he plays several instruments himself and has given his four sons and a daughter the best musical instruction possible in bonn all are pianists and so many of them performers on other instruments that the production of quintets is a common family enjoyment he is a devoted admirer of haydn with whom he corresponds and in his large collection of music there are already eighty symphonies thirty quartets and forty trios by that master his rare and valuable instruments are so numerous that he could almost equip a complete orchestra every musician is his friend and welcome to him count alstadter in his house one may at times hear a very good quartet captain d'antoine a passionate admirer and knower of music plays the violin and the clavier a little he learned composition from the books of marpurg kernberger and Ripel. formed his taste in italy in both respects the reading of scores by classical masters has been a great service to him among his compositions are several operettas symphonies and quartets in haydn's style the three messieurs Fasius, sons of the russian agent here are soundly musical the two elder play the flute and the youngest plays the violoncello according to fischer the members of this family were visitors at the house of the beethovens 
there are many more music lovers here but the majority of them are too much given to privacy so far as their musical practice goes to be mentioned here enough has been said to show that a stranger fond of music need never leave bond without nourishment nevertheless a large public concert institution under the patronage of his electoral grace is still desirable it would be one more ornament of the capital and a promoter of the good cause of music what with the theatre the court music the musical productions in the church and such opportunities in private it is plain that young talent in those days in bonn was in no danger of starvation for want of what neef calls musicaliska na rung so much upon the dramatis personae other than the principal figure and his family let an attempt follow to describe the little city as it appeared in seventeen seventy in other words to picture the scene by an enumeration made in seventeen eighty nine the population of bonn was nine thousand five hundred and sixty souls a number which probably for a long series of years had rarely varied beyond a few score more or less one therefore that must very nearly represent the aggregate in seventeen seventy for the town had neither manufactures nor commerce beyond what its own wants supported it was simply the residence of the elector the seat of the court and the people depended more or less directly upon that court for subsistence as a wag expressed it all bon was fed from the elector's kitchen the old city walls the gar guta fortification das der chur first sicker genug darinnen hof halten kann of johann hubner's description were already partially destroyed within them the whole population seems to have lived outside the city gates it does not appear that save by a chapel or two the eye was impeded in its sweep across gardens and open fields to the surrounding villages which then as now hidden in clusters of walnut and fruit trees appeared when looked upon from the neighbouring hills like islands rising upon the level surface of the plain the great increase of wealth and population during the last one hundred and fifty years in all this part of the rhine valley under the influence of the wise national economy of the prussian government has produced corresponding changes in and about the towns and villages but the grand features of the landscape are unchanged the ruins upon the drachenfels and gottesburg look down as now upon the distant roofs and spires of bonn the castle of siegberg rose above the plains away to the east the chapel crowned the petersburg the church with the marble stairs the nearer Kreutzberg the fine landing-place with its growing trees and seats for idlers the villas hotels coffee-houses and dwellings outside the old walls are all recent but the huge ferry-boat the flying bridge even then was ever swinging like a pendulum from shore to shore steam as a locomotive power was unknown and the commerce of the rhine floated by the town gliding down with the current on rafts or in clumsy but rather picturesque boats or impelled against the stream by the winds by horses and even by men and women the amount of traffic was not however too great to be amply provided for in this manner for population was kept down by war by the hard and rude life of the peasant class and by the influences of all the false national economic principles of that age which restrained commerce by every device that could be made to yield present profit to the rulers of the rhine lands passengers had for generations no longer been plundered by mail-clad robbers dwelling upon a hundred picturesque heights but each petty state had gained from the emperor's weakness vested rights and all sorts of custom levies and taxes Rysbeck, seventeen eighty found nine toll stations between mayence and coblentz and thence to the boundary of holland he declares there were at least sixteen and that in the average each must have collected thirty thousand rhenish florins per annum to the stranger coming down from mayence with its narrow dark lanes or up from cologne whose confined and pestiferously dirty street emitting unnamed stenches were but typical of the bigotry superstition and moral filth of the population all now happily changed thanks to a long period of french and prussian rule little bond seemed a very picture of neatness and comfort even its ecclesiastical life seemed of another order the men of high rank in the church were of high rank also by birth they were men of the world and gentlemen their manners were polished and their minds enlarged by intercourse with the world and with gentlemen they were tolerant in their opinions and liberal in their views ecclesiastics of high and low degree were met at every corner as in other cities of the rhine region but absence of military men was a remarkable feature johann hubner gives the reason for this in few and quaint words in times of war much depends upon who is master bond because traffic on the rhine can be blockaded at this pass 
therefore the place has its excellent fortification which enables the elector to hold his court in ample security within its walls but he need not maintain a garrison there in time of peace and in time of war troops are garrisoned who have taken the oath to the emperor and the empire this was settled by the peace of ryswick as well as restadt while the improvement in the appearance of the streets of bonn has necessarily been great through the refitting or rebuilding of a large portion of the dwelling-houses the plan of the town except in those parts lying near the wall has undergone no essential change the principal one being the open spaces where in seventeen seventy churches stood on the small triangular rumor plots was the principal parish church of bonn that of st remigius standing in such a position that its tall tower looked directly down the archerstrasse in eighteen hundred this tower was set on fire by lightning and destroyed six years later the church itself was demolished by the french and its stones removed to become a part of the fortifications of at wessel on the small round grass plot as one goes from the munster church toward the neighboring city gate newthor stood another parish church a rotunda in form that of st martin which fell in eighteen twelve and was removed and at the opposite end of the minster separated from it only by a narrow passage was still a third the small structure dedicated to st gangolf this too was pulled down in eighteen o six only the fourth parish church that of st peter in dykirchen is still in existence and was at a later date considerably enlarged after the demolition of these buildings a new division of the town into parishes was made eighteen o six the city front of the electoral palace now the university was more imposing than now and was adorned by a tall handsome tower containing a carillon with bells numerous enough to play for instance the overture to monsigny's deserter this part of the palace with the tower and chapel was destroyed by fire in seventeen seventy seven the town hall erected by clemens auguste and the other churches were as now but the large edifice facing the university library and museum of castes now occupied by private dwellings and shops was then the cloister and church of the franciscan monks a convent of capuchin nuns stood upon the kesselgasse its garden is now a bleaching ground let the fancy picture upon a fine easter or pentecost morning in those years the little city in its holiday attire and bustle the bells in palace and church tower ringing the peasants in coarse but picturesque garments the women abounding in bright colours come in from the surrounding villages fill the market-place and crowd the churches at the early masses the nobles and gentry in broad flapped coats wide waistcoats and knee breeches the entire dress often of brilliant coloured silks satins and velvets huge white flowing neckcloths ruffles over the hands buckles of silver or even of gold at the knees and upon the shoes huge wigs becurled and bepowdered on the heads and surmounted by the cocked hat when not held under the arm a sword at the side and commonly a gold-headed cane in the hand and if the morning be cold a scarlet cloak thrown over the shoulders are daintily picking their way to the palace to kiss his transparency's hand or dashing up to the gates in heavy carriages with white-wigged and cocked-hatted coachmen and footmen their ladies wear long and narrow bodices but their robes flow with a mighty sweep their apparent stature is increased by very high-heeled shoes and by piling up their hair on lofty cushions their sleeves are short but long silk gloves cover their arms the ecclesiastics various in name and costume dresses now save in the matter of the flowing wig the elector's company of guards is out and at intervals the thunder of the artillery on the walls is heard on all sides strong and brilliant contrasts of colour meet the eye velvet and silk purple and fine linen gold and silver such were the fashions of the time costly inconvenient in form but imposing magnificent and marking the differences of rank and class let the imagination picture all this and it will have a scene familiar to the boy beethoven and one in which as he grew up to manhood he had his own small part to play End of section three. section four of the life of ludwig von beethoven volume one by alexander wheelock thayer translated by henry edward crebiel this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the ancestral von beethoven family in belgium removal of the grandfather to bonn his activities as singer and chapel master birth and education of johann von beethoven the parents of the composer the composer's belgian ancestry 
at the beginning of the seventeenth century a family named von beethoven lived in a village of belgium near louvain a member of it removed to and settled in antwerp about sixteen fifty a son of this beethoven named william a wine dealer married september eleventh sixteen eighty catherine grandjean and had issue eight children one of them baptized september eighth sixteen eighty three in the parish of notre dame now received the name henri adelard his sponsors being henri von beethoven acting for adelard de redinck baron de roquigny and jacqueline grandjean this henri adelard beethoven having arrived at man's estate took to wife maria catherine de hart who bore him twelve children the third named louis the twelfth named louis joseph the latter baptized december nine seventeen twenty eight married november three seventeen seventy three maria theresa schwero veggs and died november eleven eighteen o eight at oosterwick the second daughter named like her mother maria theresa married september six eighteen o eight joseph michael jacobs and became the mother of jacob jacobs in the middle of the nineteenth century a professor of painting in antwerp who supplied in part the materials for these notices of the antwerp beethovens although the principal credit is due to m leon de bourbourg of that city the certificate of baptism of louis von beethoven third son of henri adelar is to this effect antwerp december twenty three seventeen twelve baptizatus ludovicus parents henricus von beethoven and maria catherine de hart sponsors petrus Belmart and defona von beethoven it is a family tradition professor jacobs heard it from his mother that this louis von beethoven owing to some domestic difficulties according to m berbure they were financial secretly left his father's house at an early age and never saw it again although in later years an epistolary correspondence seems to have been established between the fugitive and his parents gifted with a good voice and well educated musically he went to louvain and applied for a vacant position as tenor to the chapter ad sanctum petrum receiving it on november two seventeen thirty one a few days later the young man of eighteen years was appointed substitute for three months for the singing master phonascus who had fallen ill as is attested by the minutes of the chapter under date november two seventeen thirty one the young singer does not seem to have filled the place beyond the prescribed time by a decree of elector clemens auguste dated march seventeen thirty three the month of joseph haydn's birth he became court musician in bonn with a salary of four hundred florins a large one for those days particularly in the case of a young man who only three months before had completed his twentieth year allowing the usual year of probation to which candidates for the court chapel were subjected beethoven must have come to bonn in seventeen thirty two this corresponds to the time spent at louvain as well as to a petition of seventeen seventy four to be given hereafter in which johann speaks of his father's forty-two years of service there is another paper of date seventeen eighty four which makes the elder beethoven to have served about forty-six years but this is from another hand and of less authority than that written by the son other beethoven families in bonn what it was that persuaded ludwig von beethoven to go to bonn is unknown gottfried fischer who owned the house in the rheingasse in which two generations of beethovens lived professed to know that elector clemens auguste learned to know him as a good singer at liege and for that reason called him to bonn that is not impossible whether the elector went to louvain or ludwig introduced himself to him at liege but it is significant that another branch of the beethoven family was already represented at bonn michael von beethoven was born at malines in february sixteen eighty four he was a son of cornelius von beethoven and catherine liempole and beyond doubt as the later associations in bonn prove closely related to the antwerp branch of the family michael von beethoven married maria ludovica stukers or stukens on october eighth seventeen o seven 
his eldest son also bore the name of cornelius born in september seventeen o eight in malines and there were four other sons born to him during his stay in malines among them two who were named louis up to seventeen fifteen at a date which is uncertain this family removed to bonn there cornelius on february twenty seventeen thirty four married a widow named helena de la porte nee column in the church of st gangolf ludwig von beethoven the young court singer being one of the witnesses in august of the same year cornelius was proxy for his father who evidently had not yet come to bonn as godfather for ludwig's first child later after his son had established a household he removed to bonn for michael von beethoven died in june seventeen forty nine in bonn and in december of the same year maria ludovico stukens sick the widow von beethoven cornelius became a citizen of bonn on january seventeen seventeen thirty six on the ground that he had married the widow of a citizen and in seventeen thirty eight he stands alone as representative of the name in the list of bonn's citizens he seems to have been a merchant and is probably the man who figures in the annual accounts of clemens august as purveyor of candles he lost his wife and for a second married anna barbara marx Weirgo on july five seventeen fifty five who bore him two daughters seventeen fifty six and seventeen fifty nine both of whom died young and for both of whom ludwig van beethoven was sponsor cornelius died in seventeen sixty four and his wife in seventeen sixty five and with this the maline branch of the family ended which one of the two cousins for so we may in a general way consider them came to bonn ludwig or cornelius must be left to conjecture there is evidence in favour of the former in the circumstance that cornelius does not appear as witness at the marriage of ludwig in seventeen thirty three if ludwig was the earlier arrival then the story of his call by the elector may be true he was not disappointed in his hope of being able to make his way by reason of his knowledge of music and singing the next recorded fact in his history may be seen in the ancient register of the parish of st remigius now preserved in the town hall of bonn it is the marriage on september seventh seventeen thirty three of ludwig van beethoven and maria josepha pole the husband not yet twenty-one years of age the wife nineteen then follows in the records of baptisms in the parish seventeen thirty four august eight parents ludwig van beethoven maria josepha pole baptized maria bernardina ludovica sponsors maria bernardita mentz michael van beethoven in his place cornelius van beethoven the child bernardina died in infancy october seventeenth seventeen thirty five her place was soon filled by a son marcus josephus baptized april fifteenth seventeen thirty six of whom the parents were doubtless early bereaved for no other notice whatever has been found of him after the lapse of some four years the childless pair again became parents by the birth of a son whose baptismal record has not been discovered it is supposed that this child johann was baptized in the court chapel the records of which are not preserved in the archives of the town and seem to be lost or that possibly he was born while the mother was absent from bonn an official report upon the condition and characters of the court musicians made in seventeen eighty four however gives johann von beethoven born in bonn and aged forty four thus fixing the date of his birth towards the end of seventeen thirty nine or the beginning of seventeen forty the gradual improvement of the elder beethoven's condition in respect of both emolument and social position is creditable to him alike as a musician and as a man poorly as the musicians were paid he was able in his last years to save a small portion of his earnings his rise in social position is indicated in the public records thus the first child is recorded as the son of l v beethoven musicus as sponsor to the eldest daughter of cornelius von beethoven he appears as dominus von beethoven to the second as 
musicus aulicus in 1761 he becomes herr kapelmeister and his name appears in the court calendar of the same year third in a list of twenty-eight homme de chambre honoraire of the elder beethoven's appointment as head of the court music no other particulars have been obtained than those to be found in his petition and the accompanying decree printed in chapter one from these papers it appears that the bass singer has had the promise of the place from clemens august as successor to zudoli but that the elector when the vacancy occurred changed his mind and gave it to his favorite young violinist touche moulin who held the position for so short a time however that his name never appears as chapelmaster in the court calendar he having resigned on account of the reduction of his salary by belderbush prime minister of the new elector who just at that period succeeded clemens august the elevation of a singer to such a place was not a very uncommon event in those days but that a chapel master should still retain his place as singer probably was hasse and Graun began their careers as vocalists but more to the point are the instances of stefani handel's predecessor at the court of hanover and of Regini, successively chapel master at mayence and berlin in all these cases the incumbents were distinguished and very successful composers beethoven was not wegler's words the chapel master and bass singer had at an earlier date produced operas at the national theatre established by the elector have been rather interpreted than quoted by schindler and others thus it is thought that under the luxury loving elector clemens august he produced operas of his own composition a construction which is clearly forced and incorrect strange that so few writers can content themselves with exact citations not only is there no proof whatever certainly none yet made public that chapelmaster von beethoven was an author of operatic works but the words in his own petition inasmuch as the toxel must be sufficiently supplied with music can hardly be otherwise understood than as intended to meet a possible objection to his appointment on the ground of his not being a composer wegler's words then would simply mean that he put upon the stage and conducted the operatic works produced which were neither numerous nor of a very high order during his time his labors were certainly onerous enough without adding musical composition the records of the electoral court which have been described and in part reproduced in the preceding chapter exhibit him conducting the music of chapel theatre and toxel examining candidates for admission into the electoral musical service reporting upon questions referred to him by the privy council and the like and all this in addition to his services as bass singer a position which gave him the principal bass parts and solos to sing both in chapel and theatre wegler reports a tradition that in gassmann's operetta la mort artigiano and monsignor's desertur he was admirable and received the highest applause if this be true it proves no small degree of enterprise on his part as chapel-master and of well-conserved powers as a singer for these two operas were first produced the one in vienna the other in paris in 1769 when beethoven had already entered his fifty-eighth year the words of demmer in his petition of january twenty three seventeen seventy three the bass singer von beethoven is incapacitated and can no longer serve as such naturally suggests the thought that the old gentleman's appearance as brunoro in lucchese's langano scoperto in may seventeen seventy three was a final compliment to his master the elector upon his birthday he did not live to celebrate another the death of ludwig von beethoven hofkabel meister is recorded at bonn under date of december twenty fourth seventeen seventy three one day after the sixty-first anniversary of his baptism in antwerp chapel master von beethoven's trials at home the good man had his cross to bear his wife josepha who with one exception had buried all her children and possibly on that very account became addicted to the indulgence of an appetite for strong drink was at the date of her husband's death living as a boarder in a cloister at cologne 
how long she had been there does not appear but doubtless for a considerable period the son too was married but though near was not in his father's house the separation was brought about by his marriage with which the father was not agreed the house in which the chapel master died and which he occupied certainly as early as seventeen sixty five was that next north of the so-called gudenauer hof later the post office and the neighbouring bongasse and bore the number three eighty six the chapel master appears upon pretty good evidence to have removed hither from the fisher house in the rheingasse where he is said to have lived many years and even to have carried on a trade in wine which change of dwelling may have taken place in seventeen sixty seven when one recalls the imposing style of dress at the era the short muscular man with dark complexion and very bright eyes as begler describes him and as a painting by court painter radu still in possession of his descendants in vienna depicts him presents quite an imposing picture to the imagination of the early life of johann von beethoven there are no particulars preserved except such as are directly or indirectly conveyed in the official documents such of these papers as came from his own hand if judged by the standard of our time show a want of ordinary education but it must not be forgotten that the orthography of the german language was not then fixed nor that many a contemporary of his who boasted a university education or who belonged to the highest ranks of society wrote in a style no better than his this is certain that after he had received an elementary education he was sent to the gymnasium for as a member of the lowest class in fema of that institution he took part in september seventeen fifty as singer in the annual school play which it was the custom of the musee bonenses to give it would seem therefore that his good voice and musical gifts were appreciated at an early period herein probably is also to be found the reason why his stay at the gymnasium was not of long duration the father had sent him apart for his service in the court music and himself as appears from the statements already printed undertook his instruction he taught him singing and clavier playing whether or not he also taught him violin playing in which he was capable remains uncertain in seventeen fifty two at the age of twelve as can be seen from his petition of march seventeen fifty six and his father's of seventeen sixty four he entered the chapel as soprano according to gottwald's report of seventeen fifty six he had served about two years the contradiction is probably explained by an interruption caused by the mutation of his voice at the age of sixteen he received his decretum as accessus on the score of his skill in singing and his experience already acquired including his capability on the violin which was the basis of the decree of april twenty four seventeen sixty four granting him a salary of one hundred reichsthaler per annum so at the age of twenty-two the young man received the promise of a salary and at twenty-four obtained one of one hundred thalers in seventeen sixty nine he received an increase of twenty-five florins and fifty florins more by the decree of april three seventeen seventy two he had moreover an opportunity to gain something by teaching not only did he give lessons in singing and clavier playing to the children of prominent families of the city but he also frequently was called on to prepare young musicians for service in the chapel thus demmer says the memorandum heretofore given paid six reichsthaler to young mr beethoven for three months and a year later the following resolve of the privy council was passed odd supplication johann beethoven the demands of the suppliant having been found to be correct the electoral treasury is commanded to satisfy the debt by the usual withdrawal of the sum from the salary of the defendant bond may twenty fourth seventeen seventy five attested p which probably refers to a debt contracted by one of the women of the court chapel a few years later as we have seen he seems to have been entrusted with the training of johanna helena averdonk whom he brought forward as his pupil in march seventeen seventy eight and the singer got Sinello was his pupil before she went elsewhere it was largely his own fault that the musically gifted man was unfortunate 
in both domestic and official relations his intemperance in drink probably inherited from his mother but attributed by old fisher to the wine trade in which his father embarked made itself apparent at an early date and by yielding to it more and more as he grew older he undoubtedly impaired his voice and did much to bring about his later condition of poverty how it finally led to a catastrophe we shall see later according to the testimony of the widow carth he was a tall handsome man and wore powdered hair in his later years fisher does not wholly agree with her of medium height longish face broad forehead round nose broad shoulders serious eyes face somewhat scarred thin pigtail three and a half years after obtaining his salary of one hundred thalers he ventured to marry heinrich heverich the father of his wife was head cook in that palace at ehrenbreitstein in which clemens danced himself out of this world but he died before that event took place his wife as the church records testified was anna clara de bouch her daughter maria magdalena born december nineteenth seventeen forty six married a certain johann lane valet of the elector of treves on january thirty seventeen sixty three on november twenty eighth seventeen sixty five the husband died and maria magdalena was a widow before she had completed her nineteenth year in a little less than two years the marriage register of st remigius at bonn was enriched by this entry the parents of the composer may twelve november nine praevia dispensatione super tribus denuntiationibus copulavi de joannum van beethoven deni ludovici van beethoven et marie josephi pol conjugum filium legitimum et marium magdalenam catheric we duam lame ex herenbreitstein enrici catheric et ani clari westorfs filiam legitimam coram testibus josepho clemente del seraski et philippo salomon that is johann von beethoven has married the young widow lane how it came that the marriage took place in bonn instead of the home of the bride we are told by fisher chapelmaster von beethoven was not at all agreed that his son should marry a woman of a lower station in life than his own he did not continue his opposition against the fixed determination of his son but it is to be surmised that he would not have attended a ceremony in ehrenbreitstein and hence the matter was disposed of quickly in bonn after the wedding the young pair paid a visit of a few days duration to ehrenbreitstein character of madame von beethoven fischer describes madame von beethoven as a handsome slender person and tells of her rather tall longish face a nose somewhat bent gets her felt in the dialect of bonn spare earnest eyes Cecilia fischer could not recall that she had ever seen madame von beethoven laugh she was always serious her life's vicissitudes may have contributed to this disposition the early loss of her father and of her first husband and the death of her mother scarcely more than a year after her second marriage it is difficult to form a conception of her character because of the paucity of information about her wegler lays stress upon her piety and gentleness her amiability and kindliness towards her family appear from all the reports nevertheless fisher betrays the fact that she could be vehement in controversies with the other occupants of the house madame von beethoven fisher continues was a clever woman she could give converse and reply aptly politely and modestly to high and low and for this reason she was much liked and respected she occupied herself with sewing and knitting they led a righteous and peaceful married life and paid their house rent and baker's bills promptly quarterly and on the day she was a good a domestic woman she knew how to give and also how to take in a manner that is becoming to all people of honest thoughts from this it is fair to assume that she strove to conduct her household 
judiciously and economically whether or not this was always possible in view of the limited income old fisher does not seem to have been informed she made the best she could of the weaknesses of her husband without having been able to influence him her care for the children in externals was not wholly sufficient young ludwig clung to her with a tender love more than to the father who was only severe but there is nothing anywhere to indicate that she exerted an influence upon the emotional life and development of her son and in respect of this no wrong will be done her if the lower order of her culture be taken into consideration nor must it be forgotten that in all probability she was naturally delicate and that her health was still further weakened by her domestic troubles and frequent accouchements the quiet suffering woman as madame carth calls her died in seventeen eighty seven of consumption at the age of forty years long years after in vienna beethoven was wont when among his intimate friends to speak of his excellent vortreflichter mother at the time when johann von beethoven married there was quite a colony of musicians and other persons in the service of the court in the bongasse as that street is in part named which extends from the lower extremity of the market-place to the cologne gate chapelmaster von beethoven had left the house in the rheingasse and lived at number three eighty six in the adjoining house north number three eighty seven lived the musical family reese farther down the east house on that side of the way before the street assumes the name kurnerstrasse was the dwelling of the hornist afterward publisher simrock nearly opposite the chapel masters the second story of the house number five fifteen was occupied but not till after seventeen seventy one by the salomons the parterre and first floor by the owner of the house a lace-maker or dealer in laces named clausen of the two adjoining houses the one number five seventy six was the dwelling of johann baum a master locksmith doubtless the jean corton serurier of the court calendar for seventeen seventy three in number six seventeen was the family hotel twelve or fifteen years later living under the beethovens in the benzelgasse and not far off a family pole perhaps relations of madame beethoven the elder conrad pole's name is found in the court calendars of the seventeen seventies as one of the eight electoral high footmen in seventeen sixty seven in the rear of the clausen house north there was a lodging to let and there the newly married beethovens began their humble housekeeping their first child was a son ludwig maria baptized april two seventeen sixty nine whose sponsors as may be read in the register of st remigius parish were the grandfather beethoven and anna maria low wife of jean corton the next-door neighbor this child lived but six days in two years the loss of the parents was made up by the birth of him who is the subject of this biography End of chapter two section five of the life of ludwig von beethoven volume one by alexander wheelock thayer translated by henry edward crabeel this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the childhood of beethoven an inebriate grandmother and a dissipated father the family homes in bonn the boy's schooling his music teachers visits holland with his mother there is no authentic record of beethoven's birthday wegler on the ground of custom in bonn dates it the day preceding the ceremony of baptism an opinion which beethoven himself seems to have entertained it is the official record of this baptism only that has been preserved in the registry of the parish of saint remigius the entry appears as follows parentis d johannes von beethoven and helena keverich conjugus prolace seventeen seventy december ludovicus patrini d ludovicus von beethoven and gertrudis muller dicta bombs the sponsors therefore were beethoven's grandfather the chapel master and the wife of the next-door neighbor johann baum secretary at the electoral cellar 
the custom obtaining at the time in the catholic rhine country not to postpone the baptism beyond twenty-four hours after the birth of a child it is in the highest degree probable that beethoven was born on december sixteenth seventeen seventy of several certificates of baptism the following is copied in full for the sake of a remark upon it written by the master's own hand department de rhin et moselle marie de bonne extrait du registre de naissance de la paroisse de saint remy à bonne anno melissimo septingentissimo septuagesimo de decima septima decembris baptizatus est ludovicus parentis de johannes von beethoven et helena keveriches conjugus patrini de ludovicus von beethoven et gertrudis muller's dicta balms pour extrait confirme de livrée à la mairie de bonn bon le de juin eighteen ten signatures and official seals on the back of this paper beethoven wrote seventeen seventy two es scheint der taufschein nicht reichtig da nacht ein ludwig von mir eine baumgarten war glaube ich mein pater ludwig van beethoven the composer then even in his fortieth year still believed the correct date to be seventeen seventy two which is the one given in all the old biographical notices and which corresponds to the dates affixed to many of his first works and indeed to nearly all allusions to his age in his early years only by keeping this fact in mind can the long list of chronological contradictions which continually meet the student of his history during the first half of his life be explained or comprehended whoever examines the original record of baptism in the registry of bonn sees instantly that the certificate in spite of beethoven is correct but all possible doubt is removed by the words of Wegler. little louis clung to his grandfather with the greatest affection and young as he was when he lost him his early impressions always remained lively he liked to speak of his grandfather with the friends of his youth and his pious and gentle mother whom he loved much more than he did his father who was only severe was obliged to tell him much of his grandfather had seventeen seventy two been the correct date the child could never have retained personal recollections of a man who died on december twenty four seventeen seventy three a survey of the whole ground renders the conclusion irresistible that at the time when the boy began to attract notice by his skill upon the pianoforte and by the promise of his first attempts in composition his age was purposely falsified a motive for which may perhaps be found in the excitement caused in the musical world by the then recent career of the mozart children and in the reflection that attainments which in a child of eight or ten years excite wonder and astonishment are considered hardly worthy of special remark in one a few years older there is unfortunately nothing known of johann von beethoven's character which renders such a trick improbable noteworthy is it that at first the falsification rarely extends beyond one year and also that in an official report in seventeen eighty four the correct age is given here an untruth could not be risked nor be of advantage if it had been dr c m Niesel, who championed the cause of the house in the bon gasse in a controversy conducted in the kolniska zeitung in eighteen forty five touching the birthplace of beethoven remarks that the mother was as is known a native of the aaron breitstein valley and separated from her relatives he johann von beethoven was without relatives and in somewhat straitened circumstances financially what then was more natural than that he should invite his neighbor frau baum a respected and well-to-do woman in whose house the baptismal feast was held to be sponsor for his little son this last fact indicates clearly the narrowness of the quarters in which the young couple dwelt does it not also hint that the grandfather was now a solitary man with no home in which to spread the little feast let johann von beethoven himself describe 
the pecuniary condition in which he found himself upon the death of his father most reverend archbishop most gracious elector and lord lord will your electoral grace graciously be pleased to hear that my father has passed away from this world to whom it was granted to serve his electoral grace clemens august and your electoral grace and gloriously reigning lord lord forty-two years as chapel-master with great honour whose position i have been found capable of filling but nevertheless i would not venture to offer my capacity to your electoral grace but since the death of my father has left me in needy circumstances my salary not sufficing and i compelled to draw on the savings of my father my mother still living and in a cloister at a cost of sixty roiks thaler for board and lodging each year and it is not advisable for me to take her to my home your electoral grace is therefore humbly implored to make an allowance from the four hundred reichs thaler vacated for an increase of my salary so that i may not need to draw upon the little savings and my mother may receive the pension graciously for the few years which she may yet live to deserve which high grace it shall always be my striving your electoral grace is most humble and obedient servant and musicus jean van beethoven there is something bordering on the comic in the coolness of the hint here given that the petitioner would not object to an appointment as his father's successor especially when it is remembered that lucchese and mattioli were already in bond and the former had sufficiently proved his capacity by producing su successful operas both text and music for the elector's delectation the hint was not taken what provision was granted him however may be seen from a petition of january eighth seventeen seventy four praying for an addition to his salary from that made vacant by the death of his father and a pension to his mother who had kept at board in a cloister a memorandum appears on the margin to the effect that the elector graciously consents that the widow so long as she remains in the cloister shall receive sixty roixthaler quarterly another petition of a year later has been lost but its contents are indicated in the response dated june five seventeen seventy five that johann von beethoven on the death of his mother shall have the enjoyment of the sixty reichsthaler which had been granted her the death of the mother followed a few months later and was thus announced in the intelligenzblatt of bonn on october three seventeen seventy five died on september thirty maria josepha pauls sick widow von beethoven aged sixty one years in a list of salaries for seventeen seventy six among the papers at dusseldorf for the music party the salary of johann von beethoven is given at thirty six reuchsthaler forty five alb payable quarterly the fact of the great poverty in which he and his family lived is manifest from the official documents which confirm the many traditions to that effect and from the more important recollections of aged people of bonn brought to light in a controversy concerning the birthplace of the composer for instance dr hennis in his unsuccessful effort to establish the claims of the fisher house in the rheingasse says the legacy left him johann von beethoven by his father did not last long that fine lenin which as i was told could be drawn through a ring found its way piece by piece out of the house even the beautiful large portrait showing the father wearing a tassel cap and holding a roll of music went to the second-hand shop this is an error though the painting may have gone for a time to the pawnbroker from the bon gasse the beethovens removed when is uncertain to a house number seven or number eight on the left as one enters the dreikplatz in passing from the sternstrasse to the munsterplatz they were living there in seventeen seventy four for the baptism of another son on the eighth of april of that year is recorded in the register of the parish of st gangolf to which those houses belonged this child's name was caspar anton karl the first two names from his sponsor the minister Veldebusch the third from caroline von salzenhofen abbess of village 
was this condescension on the part of the minister and the abbess intended to soothe father under the failure of his hopes of advancement from the dryark plots the beethovens migrated to the fisher house number nine thirty four in the rheingasse so long held to be the composer's birthplace and long thereafter distinguished by a false inscription to that effect whether the removal took place in ludwig's fifth or sixth year is not known but at all events it was previous to the second of october seventeen seventy six for upon that day another son of johann von beethoven was baptized in the parish of st remigius by the name of nicholas johann dr hennis in his letter to the Kurniska zeitung lays much stress upon the testimony of Cecilia fisher he says the maiden lady of seventy-six years Cecilia fisher still remembers distinctly to have seen little louis in his cradle and can tell many anecdotes about him etc the mistake is easily explained without supposing any intentional deception sixty-two years afterwards she mistook the birth of nicholas johann for that of ludwig according to fisher's report the family removed from this house in seventeen seventy six for a short time to one in the new gasse but returned again to the house in the rheingasse after the palace fire in seventeen seventy seven one thought which suggests itself in relation to these removals of johann von beethoven may perhaps be more than mere fancy that in expectation of advancement in position upon the death of his father he had exchanged the narrow quarters of the lodging in the rear of the classen house for the much better dwelling in the dryark plots but upon the failure of his hopes had been fain to seek a cheaper place in the lower part of the town down near the river there is nothing decisive as to the time when the musical education of ludwig von beethoven began nor any positive evidence that he like handel haydn or mozart showed remarkable genius for the art at a very early age Schlosser has something on this point but he gives no authorities while the particulars which he relates could not possibly have come under his own observation muller had heard from franz ries and nicholas simrock that johann von beethoven gave his son instruction upon the pianoforte and violin in his earliest childhood to scarcely anything else did he hold him in the dedication of the pianoforte sonatas seventeen eighty three to the elector the boy is made to say music became my first youthful pursuit in my fourth year which might be supposed decisive on the point if his age were not falsely given on the title page this much is certain that after the removal to the fisher house the child had his daily task of musical study and practice given him and in spite of his tears was forced to execute it Cecilia fisher writes hennis still sees him a tiny boy standing on a little footstool in front of the clavier to which the implacable severity of his father had so early condemned him the patriarch of bonn head burgomaster windeck will pardon me if i appeal to him to say that he too saw the little louis von beethoven in this house standing in front of the clavier and weeping to this writes dr Vegler, i saw the same thing how the fisher house was perhaps still is connected by a passageway in the rear with a house in the Giergasse, which was then occupied by the owner a high official of the rhenish revenue service mr bakken grandfather of court councillor bakken of this city the youngest son of the latter benedict was my schoolmate and on my visits to him the doings and sufferings of louis were visible from the house it must be supposed that the father had seen indications of his son's genius for it is difficult to imagine such an one remaining unperceived but the necessities of the family with the failure of the petition for a better salary sent in just at the time when the elector was so largely increasing his expenditures for music by the engagement of lucchese and mattioli and in other ways are sufficient reasons for the inflexible severity with which the boy was kept at his studies the desire to say something new and striking on the part of many who have written about beethoven has led to such an admixture of fact and fancy that it is now very difficult to separate them one schlosser tells his readers that the greatest joy of the lad was when his father took him upon his knees and permitted him to accompany a song on the clavier with his tiny fingers 
while others tell the tale of his childhood in a manner to convey the idea that the father was a pitiless tyrant the boy a victim and a slave an error which a calm consideration of what is really known of the facts in the case at once dispels there is but one road to excellence even for the genius of a handel or a mozart unremitted application to this young ludwig was compelled sometimes no doubt through the fear of or the actual infliction of punish or for neglect sometimes to the father whose habits were such as to favour a bad interpretation of his conduct was no doubt harsh and unjust and such seems to be the truth at any rate the boy at an early date acquired so considerable a facility upon the clavier that his father could have him play at court and when he was seven years old produce him with one of his pupils at a concert in bonn here is the announcement of the concert as it was reproduced in the kurl niska zeitung of december eighteen eighteen seventy from the original avertissement to-day march twenty sixth seventeen seventy eight in the musical concert room in the sternen gasse the electoral court tenorist beethoven will have the honour to produce two of his scholars namely mademoiselle Averdon, court contraltist and his little son of six years the former will have the honour to contribute various beautiful arias the latter various clavier concertos and trios he flatters himself that he will give complete enjoyment to all ladies and gentlemen the more since both have had the honour of playing to the greatest delight of the entire court beginning at five o'clock in the evening ladies and gentlemen who have not subscribed will be charged to florin tickets may be had at the aforesaid akada my sal also of mr claren auf der bach in muhlenstein unfortunately we learn nothing concerning the pieces played by the boy nor of the success of his performance that the violin as well as the pianoforte was practised by him is implicitly confirmed by the terms in which schindler records his denial of the truth of the well-known spider story the great ludwig refused to remember any such incident much as the tale amused him on the contrary he said it was more to be expected that everything would have fled from his scraping even flies and spiders the father's main object being the earliest and greatest development of his son's musical genius so as to make it a marketable commodity he gave him no other school education than such as would afford it in one of the public schools fisher says he first attended a school in the new gasse taught by a man named hoopert and thence went to the munster schoola among the lower grade schools in bonn was the so-called tyrosinium a latin school which prepared pupils for the gymnasium but was not directly connected with it but had its own corps of teachers like the whole educational system of the period under the supervision of the academic council established by max friedrich in seventeen seventy seven the pupils learned outside of the elementary studies arithmetic and writing are said to have been excluded to read and write latin up to an understanding of cornelius nepos johann krengel a much respected pedagogue was teacher at the time and was appointed municipal schoolmaster in seventeen eighty three by academic council in seventeen eighty six he transferred the school to the bongasse to this school young beethoven was sent when is uncertain his contemporary and schoolfellow wurzer electoral councillor and afterwards president of the landgericht relates the following in his memoirs one of my schoolmates under kringle was louis von beethoven whose father held an appointment as court singer under the elector apparently his mother was already dead at the time for louis von b was distinguished by uncleanliness negligence etc not a sign was to be discovered in him of that spark of genius which glowed so brilliantly in him afterwards i imagine that he was kept down to his musical studies from an early age by his father wurzer entered the gymnasium in seventeen eighty one beethoven did not this therefore must have been the time at which all other studies were abandoned in favour of music in what manner his education was otherwise pieced out is not to be learned the lack of proper intellectual discipline is painfully obvious in beethoven's letters throughout his life in his early manhood he wrote a fair hand so very different from the shocking scrawl of his later years as to make one almost doubt the genuineness of autographs of that period but in orthography the use of capital letters punctuation 
and arithmetic he was sadly deficient all his life long he was still able to use the french tongue at a later period and of latin he had learned enough to understand the text which he composed but even as a schoolboy his studies appear to have been made second to his musical practice with which his hours out of school were apparently for the most part occupied he was described by dr muller as a shy and taciturn boy the necessary consequence of the life apart which he led observing more and pondering more than he spoke and disposed to abandon himself entirely to the feelings awakened by music and later by poetry and to the pictures created by fancy of those who were his schoolfellows and who in after years recorded their reminiscences of him no one speaks of him as a playfellow none has anecdotes to relate of games with him rambles on the hills or adventures upon the rhine and its shores in which he bore a part music and ever music hence the power of clothing his thoughts and words was not developed by early culture and the occasional bursts of eloquence in his letters and recorded conversations are held not to be genuine because so seldom found as if the strong mind struggling for adequate expression should not at times break through all barriers and overcome all obstacles urged forward thus by the father's severity by his tender love for his mother and by the awakening of his own tastes the development of his skill and talents was rapid so much so that in his ninth year a teacher more competent than his father was needed the first to whom his father turned was the old court organist van den eden who had been in the electoral service about fifty years and had come to bonn before the arrival there of ludwig van beethoven the grandfather one can easily imagine his willingness to serve an old and deceased friend by fitting his grandson to become his successor and this might account for schlosser's story that at first he taught him gratis and that he continued his instructions at the command and expense of the elector the story may or may not be true but nothing has been discovered in the archives of dusseldorf confirming the statement in fact concerning the time the subjects and the results of van den eden's instruction we are thrown largely upon conjecture in his eighth year says morrow in his notices court organist van den eden took him as a pupil nothing has been learned of his progress this if maura was correct in stating his age would have been about seventeen seventy eight it is after this that maura refers to his study under pfeiffer independently of all this fischer says his father not being able to teach him more in music and suspecting that he had talent for composition took him at first to an aged master named santorini who instructed him for a while but the father thought little of this teacher did not consider him the right man and desired a change this desire resulted in securing pfeiffer through the mediation of grossmann there was no musician santorini in the court chapel but an actor named santorini was a member of grossmann's troupe he cannot be considered in this connection there is evidently a confusion of names and the whole context especially the reference to the aged master shows that no other than van den eden was meant by the teacher who gave instruction for a short time before pfeiffer schlosser does not say that this instruction was on the organ and it is unlikely that the boy who was destined for a more systematic instruction in piano forte playing was put at the organ at so early an age it was a deduction probably from the fact that van den eden was an organist and that later beethoven displayed a great deal of dexterity upon that instrument it is noteworthy that wegler says nothing definite as to whether or not beethoven took lessons from van den eden he merely thought it likely because he knew no one else in bonn from whom beethoven could have learned the technical handling of the organ but there were several such in bonn irrespective of neef schindler makes certainty out of wegler's conjecture and relates that beethoven often spoke of the old organist when discoursing upon the proper position and movement of the body and hands in organ and piano forte playing he having been taught to hold both calm and steady to play in the connected style of handel and bach this may have been correct so far as piano forte playing is concerned but schindler had little knowledge of beethoven's bond period and the possibility of a confusion of names is not excluded even on the part of beethoven himself who received hints from several organists maurer after speaking of pfeiffer continues as follows van den eden remained his only teacher in thorough bass 
as a man of seventy he sent the boy louis between eleven and twelve years old to accompany the mass and other church music on the organ his playing was so astonishing that one was forced to believe he had intentionally concealed his gifts while preluding for the credo he took a theme from the movement and developed it to the amazement of the orchestra so that he was permitted to improvise longer than is customary that was the opening of his brilliant career maurus seems to know nothing of neath when he says that van den eden was beethoven's only teacher in thorough bass what he says too about the lad's performance at the organ as substitute obviously rests upon a confounding of van den eden with another of beethoven's organ teachers most likely neath it is our conjecture that van den eden taught the boy chiefly and perhaps exclusively pianoforte playing he being a master in that art but his influence was small it must be remembered that van den eden was a very old man as whose successor neef had been chosen in seventeen eighty one and who died in june seventeen eighty two nowhere does he like the other teachers of beethoven disclose individual traits he is a totally colourless picture in the history of beethoven's youth nor does it appear that there was any intimacy between him and the beethoven family since otherwise he would not have been missing in the notices of fisher who does not even know his name the judgment of the father that his instruction was inefficient was probably correct a fitter master it was thought was obtained in tobias friedrich pfeiffer who came to bonn in the summer of seventeen seventy nine as tenor singer in grossmann and helmuth's theatrical company maurer the violoncellist in some reminiscences of that period communicated to this work by professor jan says that pfeiffer was a skilful pianist and gave the boy lessons but not at any regular hours often when he came with beethoven the father from the wine house late at night the boy was roused from sleep and kept at the pianoforte until morning a course not particularly favourable to his progress at school but one which may be readily credited in the light of what is known of pfeiffer and johann beethoven and one moreover which would cause the lessons to make an enduring impression upon the memory there is some reason to think that the former was an inmate of the latter's family which adds probability to the story although pfeiffer was in bonn but one year begler affirms that beethoven owed most of all to this teacher and was so appreciative of the fact that he sent him financial help from vienna through simrock to what extent begler's opinion as to beethoven's obligations is correct it would be difficult to decide but the utter improbability that a single year's lessons from this man would profit a boy eight and a half to nine and a half years old more than those from any other of his teachers much longer and systematically continued is manifest about this time the young court musician franz georg rovantini lived in the same house with beethoven he was a son of a violinist johann conrad rovantini who had been called to bonn from Aaron Breitstein, and who died in seventeen sixty six he was related to the beethoven family the young musician was much respected and sought after as a teacher according to the fisher document the boy beethoven was among his pupils taking lessons on the violin and viola but these lessons too came to an early end rovantini died on september ninth seventeen eighty one aged twenty four a strong predilection for the organ was awakened early in the lad and he eagerly sought opportunities to study the instrument apparently even before he became neef's pupil in the cloister of the franciscan monks at bonn there lived a friar named willibod cock highly respected for his playing and his expert knowledge of organ construction we have no reason to doubt that young ludwig sought him out received instruction from him and made so much progress that friar willibald accepted him as assistant in the same way he made friends with the organist in the cloister of the minorites and made an agreement to play the organ there at six o'clock morning mass it would seem that he felt the need of familiarity with a larger organ than that of the franciscans on the inside of the cover of a memorandum book which he carried to vienna with him is found the note measurements fusmas, of the minorite pedals in bonn plainly he had kept an interest in the organ still another tradition is preserved in a letter to the author from miss august grimm dated september eighteen seventy two to the effect that heinrich weissen born in seventeen fifty nine organist at 
Reinbreitbach, near Honeck on the Rhine, studied the organ in company with Beethoven under a Zenzer, organist of the Munsterkirche at Bonn, and that the lad of ten years surpassed his fellow student of twenty. The tradition says that already at that time Ludwig composed pieces which were too difficult for his little hands. Why, you can't play that, Ludwig, his teacher is said to have remarked, and the boy to have replied, I will when I am bigger. When Beethoven's studies with Van den Eden began and ended, whether they were confined to the organ or pianoforte, or partook of both, these are undecided points. It does not appear that any instruction in composition was given him until he became the pupil of Neath. In the facsimile, which follows the part devoted to thorough bass in the so-called studien, the composer says, Dear friends, I took the pains to learn this only that I might write the figures readily and later instruct others. For myself, I never had to learn how to avoid errors, for from my childhood I had so keen a sensibility that I wrote correctly without knowing it had to be so, or could be otherwise. This lends plausibility at least to another anecdote related by Maurer concerning an alleged precocious composition by Beethoven. About this time, the English ambassador to the elector's court named Kressner, who had extended help to the Beethoven family, living scantily on a salary of four hundred florins, died. Louis composed a funeral cantata to his memory, his first composition. He handed his score to Lucchesi and asked him to correct the errors. Lucchesi gave it back with the remark that he could not understand it, and therefore could not comply with his request, but would have it performed. At the first rehearsal there was great astonishment at the originality of the composition, but approval was divided. After a few rehearsals the approbation grew, and the piece was performed with general applause. George Cressner came to Bonn in the autumn of 1755 and died there January 17, 1781, in the eighty-first year of his age. The about this time in Maurer's story agrees, therefore, well enough with that date. It is, however, a suspicious circumstance that Maurer had left the service and returned to Cologne in the spring of 1780, and therefore was not eyewitness to the fact, and another that the circumstance was not remembered by other members of the court chapel, not even by Franz Ries, nor by Neath, who, though not then a member, was already in Bonn. In 1780, continues Maurer, Beethoven got acquainted with Sembona, who called his attention to his neglected education, gave him lessons daily in Latin, Louis continuing a year, in six weeks he read Cicero's letters, also logic, French, and Italian, until Sambona left Bonn in order to become bookkeeper for Baltoldi in Mulheim. In the Geheim Strasse Conference Protocolin, May 20, 1787, one reads, Stephan Zambona prays to be appointed Kammer Portier, etc., to which is appended the remark, the request is not granted. Sabona is a name, too, which half a dozen years later often appears in the Bonn intelligenzblatt as that of a shopkeeper in the marketplace of that town if the story of the cantata be doubtful that of these private studies on the part of a boy in beethoven's position only in his tenth year and a schoolboy then if ever like hamlet's possible dreams in the sleep of death must give us pause mother and son undertook a voyage to holland in the beginning of the winter of seventeen eighty one the widow carth one of the hertel family born in seventeen eighty and still living in Bonn in 1861, passed her childhood in the house number 462, Wenzel Gasse, in the upper story of which the Beethovens then lived. One of her reminiscences is in place here. She distinctly remembered sitting when a child upon her own mother's knee and hearing Madame von Beethoven, a quiet, suffering woman, relate that when she went with her little boy Ludwig to Holland, it was so cold on the boat that she had to hold his feet in her lap to prevent them from being frostbitten and also that while absent ludwig played a great deal in great houses astonished people by his skill and received valuable presents the circumstance of the cold feet warmed in the mother's lap is precisely one to fasten itself in the memory of a child and form a point around which other facts might cluster another incident related in connection with his journey to holland not as a fact but as one which she had heard spoken of in her childhood and one very difficult to comprehend is that some person whether an envious boy or a heartless adult she could not tell drew a knife across the fingers of ludwig to disable him from playing end of section five
section six of the life of ludwig von beethoven volume one by alexander wheelock thayer translated by henry edward crabbeel this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four beethoven a pupil of neath his talent and skill put to use first efforts at composition johann von beethoven's family domestic tribulations christian gottlob neith succeeded the persons mentioned as beethoven's master in music when this tutorship began and ended and whether or not it be true that the elector engaged and paid him for his services in this capacity as affirmed by divers writers here again positive evidence is wanting neith came to bonn in october seventeen seventy nine received the decree of succession to the position of court organist on february fifteenth seventeen eighty one and was thus permanently engaged in the elector's service the unsatisfactory nature of the earlier instruction as well as the high reputation of neith placed in the strongest light before the bonn public by those proceedings which had compelled him to remain there would render it highly desirable to johann von beethoven to transfer his son to the latter's care it would create no surprise should proof hereafter come to light that this change was made even before the issue of the decree of february fifteenth seventeen eighty one that even then the pupil was profiting by the lessons of the zealous bacchist whether this was so or not it was more than ever necessary that the boy's talents should be put to profitable use for the father found his family still increasing the baptism of a daughter named anna maria francisca after her sponsors anna maria clemmers dick de cox and franz rovantini court musician is recorded in the st remigius register february twenty three seventeen seventy nine and her death on the twenty seventh of the same month the baptism of august franciscus georgius von beethoven franz rovantini musicus aulicus and helene avardonc patrini follows nearly two years later january seventeenth seventeen eighty one there is no minister of state now to lend his name to a child of johann von beethoven nor any lady abbess rovantini one of the youngest members of the orchestra relative and friend of the family and of frau cox the young contralto whose musical education the father had superintended take their places another indication that the head of the family is gradually sinking in social position it is schlosser who states that the elector urged neef to make it his particular care to look after the training of the young beethoven how much weight is to be attached to this assertion of a man who hastily threw a few pages together soon after the death of the composer and who begins by adopting the old era of seventeen seventy two as the date of his birth and naming his father anton may safely be left to the reader that the story may possibly have some foundation in truth is not denied but the probabilities are all against it just in these years max friedrich is busy with his trick track his balls his new operettas and comedies and with his notion of making the theatre a school of morals the truth seems to be and it is the only hypothesis that suggests itself corresponding to the established facts that johann von beethoven had now determined to make an organist of his son as the surest method of making his talents productive the appointment of neith necessarily destroyed ludwig's hope of being van den eden's successor but neith's other numerous employments would make an assistant indispensable and to this place the boy might well aspire it will be seen in the course of the narrative that beethoven never had a warmer kinder and more valuable friend than neith proved throughout the remainder of his bond life that in fact his first appointment was obtained for him through neith although this is the first hint yet published that the credit does not belong to a very different personage 
what then so natural so self-evident as that neef foreseeing the approaching necessity of some one to take charge of the little organ in the chapel at times when his duties to the grossmann company would prevent him from officiating in person should gladly undertake the training of the remarkable talents of van den eden's pupil with no wish for any other remuneration than the occasional services which the youth could render him neef's influence on beethoven dr wegler remarks neef had little influence upon the instruction of our ludwig who frequently complained of the too severe criticisms made on his first efforts in composition the first of these assertions is evidently an utter mistake in seventeen ninety three beethoven himself at all events thought differently i thank you for the counsel which you gave me so often in my progress in my divine art if i ever become a great man yours shall be a share of the credit this will give you the greater joy since you may rest assured etc thus he wrote to his old teacher as to the complaint of harsh criticism it may be remarked that neef reared in the strict leipzig school must have been greatly dissatisfied with the direction which the young genius was taking under the influences which surrounded him and that he should labour to change its course he was still a young man and in his zeal for his pupil's progress may well have criticised his childish compositions with a severity which though no more than just and reasonable may have so contrasted with injudicious praise from other quarters as to wound the boy's self-esteem and leave a sting behind especially if neef indulged in a tone at all contemptuous a common fault of young men in like cases probably in some conversation upon this point beethoven may have remarked to wegler that neef had criticised him in his childhood rather too severely but to return from the broad field of hypothesis to the narrow path of facts on this day june twenty seventeen eighty two neef writes of himself and the grossmann company we entered upon our journey to munster whither the elector also went the day before my predecessor court organist van den eden was buried i received permission however to leave my duties in the hands of a vicar and go along to westphalia and thence to the michaelmas fair at frankfurt the dusseldorf documents prove that this vicar was ludwig von beethoven now just eleven and a half years of age in the course of the succeeding winter neef prepared that very valuable and interesting communication to kramer's magazine which has been so largely quoted in this occurs the first printed notice of beethoven one which is honourable to head and heart of its author he writes under date of march two seventeen eighty three louis von beethoven son of the tenor singer mentioned a boy of eleven years and of most promising talent he plays the clavier very skilfully and with power reads at sight very well and to put it in a nutshell he plays chiefly the well-tempered clavichord of sebastian bach which herr neef put into his hands whoever knows this collection of preludes and fugues and all the keys which might almost be called the non plus ultra of our art will know what this means so far as his duties permitted herr neef has also given him instruction in thorough bass he is now training him in composition and for his encouragement has had nine variations for the pianoforte written by him on a march by ernst christoph dressler engraved at mannheim this youthful genius is deserving of help to enable him to travel he would surely become a second wolfgang amadeus mozart were he to continue as he has begun this allusion to mozart who had not then produced those immortal works upon which his fame now principally rests speaks well for the insight of neef and renders his high appreciation of his pupil's genius the more striking had this man then really so little influence upon its development as wegler supposed that c p e box works were included in neef's course of instruction is rendered nearly certain by the following facts he was himself a devout student of them the only reference to his father made by beethoven in all the manuscripts examined for this work an official document or two excepted is upon an unfinished copy of one of bach's cantatas in these words written by my dear father 
and one of the works most used by him in compiling his materialin fur contrapunct in eighteen o nine was bach's ver such uber die var art das clavier zu spielen the unlucky remark of fegler founded too possibly upon some expression of beethoven's in a moment of spleen but certainly not injustice has cast a shadow upon the relation between neef and his pupil writer after writer has copied without examining it does it bear examination possibly if it be supposed to relate only to execution upon the pianoforte and organ but in no other case it is self-evident that serious study in the severe school of the box was necessary to counteract the influence of the light and trivial music of the bond stage upon the young genius and to neath the credit of seeing this and acting accordingly must be given the reader's attention is called particularly to the words he is now training him in composition and for his encouragement has had nine variations for the pianoforte written by him on a march by dressler engraved at mannheim in neef's notice of beethoven above cited and the date of the article from which it is taken march two seventeen eighty three is it not perfectly clear that these variations have been recently composed and very recently printed yet upon the title stands par un jean amateur louis van beethoven âge de dix ans if this were a solitary case of apparent discrepancy between the boy's age and the year given it would attract and deserve no notice but it is one of many and adds its weight to the evidence of that falsification already spoken of a second work belonging to this period is a two-part fugue in d for the organ beethoven as neef's assistant to return to the young organist who since the publication of wegler's notizen has always been supposed to have been placed at that instrument by the elector max franz in the year seventeen eighty five as a method of giving him pecuniary aid without touching his feelings of pride and independence the place of assistant to neef was no sinecure although not involving much labor it brought with it much confinement the old organ had been destroyed by the fire of seventeen seventy seven and a small chamber instrument still supplied its place it was the constantly recurring necessity of being present at the religious services which made the position onerous on all sundays and regular festivals says the court calendar high mass at eleven a m and vespers at three sometimes four p m the vespers will be sung throughout in capellus solemnibus by the musicians of the electoral court the middle vespers will be sung by the court clergy and musicians chorally as far as the magnificat which will be performed musically on all wednesdays in lent the miserere will be sung by the chapel at five p m and on all fridays the stabat mater every saturday at three p m the litanies at the altar of our lady of loretto every day throughout the year two masses will be read the one at nine the other at eleven on sundays the latter at ten such a programme gave the organist something at least to do and when neef left bonn at four munster june twenty seventeen eighty two he left his pupil no easy task before the close of the theatrical season of the next winter seventeen eighty two to eighty three the master was obliged to call upon the boy for still farther assistance in the winter of seventeen eighty four writes the widow neef my husband of blessed memory was temporarily entrusted with the direction of the church music as well as other music at court while the electoral chapel master l was absent on a journey of several months the date is wrong for lucchese's petition for leave of absence was granted april twenty sixth seventeen eighty three thus overwhelmed with business neef could no longer conduct at the pianoforte the rehearsals for the stage and ludwig von beethoven now twelve years old became also cymbalist in the orchestra in those days every orchestra was provided with a harpsichord or pianoforte seated at which the director guided the performance playing from the score here then was in part the origin of that marvellous power with which in later years beethoven astonished 
his contemporaries of reading and playing the most difficult and involved scores at first sight the position of symbolist was one of equal honor and responsibility handel and matheson's duel grew out of the fact that the former would not leave the harpsichord on a certain occasion before the close of the performance gasman placed the young salieri at the harpsichord of the imperial opera house as the best possible means of training him to become the great conductor that he was this was the high place of honor given to haydn when in london in ludwig von beethoven's case it was the place in which he as mosel says of salieri could make practical use of what he learned from books and scores at home moreover it was a place in which he could even in boyhood hear to satiety the popular italian french and german operas of the day and learn to feel that something higher and nobler was necessary to touch the deeper feelings of the heart a place which had the elector lived ten years longer might have given the world another not merely great but prolific nay inexhaustible operatic composer the symbolist's duties doubtless came to an end with the departure of the elector for munster in may or june and he then had time for other pursuits of which composition was one a song schalder young eines madchens by him was printed this year in bostler's blumenlis für liebhaber and a rondo in c for pianoforte anonymous which immediately follows was also of his composition a more important work which before the close of the year was published by bossler with a magniloquent dedication to max friedrich was the three sonatas for pianoforte according to the title if true composed by ludwig von beethoven aged eleven years the reader can judge whether or not the eleven should be twelve to turn for a moment to the beethoven family matters this summer seventeen eighty three had brought them some sorrow again the child franz georg now just two and a half years old died august sixteenth this was another stroke of bad fortune which not only wounded the heart but added to the pecuniary difficulties of the father who was now losing his voice and whose character as described in an official report made the next summer by the words of tolerable conduct if the duties of neef during the last season had been laborious in the coming one seventeen eighty three to eighty four they were still more arduous it was the first under the new contract by which the elector assumed all the costs of the theatre and a woman madame grossmann had the direction it was all important to singers actors and whoever was concerned that the result of the experiment should be satisfactory to their employer and as the opera was more to his taste than the spoken drama so much the more difficult was neef's task besides his acting as chapel master in the place of lucchese still absent there was every forenoon rehearsal of opera as madame grossmann wrote to councillor t at which of course neef had to be present there was ever new music to be examined arranged copied composed what not all which he must attend to in short he had everything to do which could be imposed upon a theatrical music director with a salary of one thousand florins it therefore became a busy time for his young assistant who still had no recognition as member of the court chapel not even as accessist the last accessist organist was Maurice, and consequently no salary from the court but he had now more than completed the usual year of probation to which candidates were subjected and his talents and skill were well enough known to warrant his petition for an appointment the petition has not been discovered but the report made upon it to the privy council has been preserved together with the following endorsement high lord stuart count von salm referring to the petition of ludwig von beethoven for the position of assistant court organist is of the humble opinion that the grace ought to be bestowed upon him together with a small compensation the endorsement is dated bonn february twenty ninth seventeen eighty four the report upon the petition is as follows appointed assistant court organist most reverend archbishop and elector most gracious lord lord your electoral grace has graciously been pleased to demand a dutiful report from me on the petition of ludwig von beethoven to your grace under date the fifteenth inst obediently and without delay i report that suppliant's father was for twenty-nine years his grandfather for forty-six 
in the service of your most reverend electoral grace and your electoral grace's predecessors that the suppliant has been amply proved and found capable to play the court organ as he has done in the absence of organist neat also at rehearsals of the plays and elsewhere and will continue to do so in the future that your grace has graciously provided for his care and subsistence his father no longer being able to do so it is therefore my humble judgment that for these reasons the suppliant well deserves to have graciously bestowed upon him the position of assistant at the court organ and an increase of remuneration commending myself to the good will of your most reverend electoral grace i am your most reverend grace's most humble and obedient servant sigismund alter graf zu psalm und reifer scheid bonn february twenty three seventeen eighty four the action taken is thus indicated ad sup ludwig von beethoven on the obedient report the suppliant's submissive prayer granted Beruhet. bonn february twenty ninth seventeen eighty four again on the cover ad sup lud von beethoven granted Beruhet. sig bonn february twenty ninth seventeen eighty four the necessity of the case the warm recommendation of psalm reiferscheid very probably too the elector's own knowledge of the fitness of the candidate and perhaps the flattery in the dedication of the sonatas for these were the days when dedications but half disguised petitions for favour were sufficient inducements to his transparency at length to confirm the young organist in the position which neef's kindness had now for nearly two years given him opinions differ as to the precise meaning of the word Beruhet, translated granted in the above transcripts but this much is certain beethoven was not appointed assistant organist in seventeen eighty five by max franz at the instance of count waldstein but at the age of thirteen in the spring of seventeen eighty four by max friedrich and upon his own petition supported by the influence of neef and of psalm reifer scheid the appointment was made but the salary had not been determined on when an event occurred which wrought an entire change in the position of theatrical affairs at bonn the elector died on april fifteen and the theatrical company was dismissed with four weeks wages there was no longer a necessity for a second organist and fortunate it was for the assistant that his name came before max friedrich's successor in the report soon to be copied as being a regular member of the court chapel although without salary lucchese returned to bonn neef had nothing to do but play his organ cultivate his garden outside the town and give music lessons it was long before such a conjunction of circumstances occurred as would have led the economical max franz to appoint an organist adjunct happy was it therefore that one of the deceased electors last acts secured young beethoven the place early efforts at composition the excellent frau carth born in seventeen eighty could not recall to memory any period of her childhood down to the death of johann von beethoven when he and his family did not live in the lodging above that of her parents this fact together with the circumstance that no mention is made of the beethovens in the account of the great inundation of the rhine in february seventeen eighty two when all the families dwelling in the fisher house of the rhine gasse were rescued in boats from the windows of the first story added to the strong probability that beethoven's position was but the first formal step of the regular process of confirming an appointment already determined upon these points strongly suggest the idea that to ludwig's advancement his father owed the ability to dwell once more in a better part of the town that is in the pleasant house number four sixty two benzelgasse the house is very near the minorite church which contained a good organ concerning the pedal measurements of which as we have seen beethoven made a memorandum in a notebook which he carried with him to vienna in the neuen blumenlis für klavier leibhaber of this year part one pages eighteen and nineteen appeared a rondo for pianoforte in a major dal sig dal signor von beethoven and part two page forty four the arioso and einen saungling von honourable beethoven un concert pour le clavecin ou forte piano composé par louis van beethoven age de douze ans thirty-two pages manuscript written in a boy's hand may also belong to this year and judging by the handwriting to the period may also be assigned 
a movement in three parts of four pages formerly in the artaria collection without title date or remark of any kind the widow Karth perfectly remembered johann von beethoven as a tall handsome man with powdered head reese and simrock described ludwig to dr muller as a boy powerfully almost clumsily built how easily fancy pictures them the tall man walking to chapel or rehearsal with the little boy trotting by his side through the streets of bonn and the gratified expression of the father as the child takes the place and performs the duties of a man End of section six. Section seven of the life of Ludwig von Beethoven, volume one by Alexander Wheelock Thayer, translated by Henry Edward Crabeel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five Maria Theresia appearance and character of elector max franz musical culture in the austrian imperial family a royal violinist his admiration for mozart his court music maria theresia was a tender mother much concerned to see all her children well provided for in her lifetime and as independent as possible of her eldest son the heir to the throne this wish had already been fulfilled in the case of several of them the youngest son maximilian born in vienna december eighth seventeen fifty six was already chosen coadjutor to his paternal uncle duke karl of lorraine grand master of the teutonic order but to provide a more bountiful and significant support prince kaunitz formulated a plan which pleased the maternal heart of the monarch and whose execution was calculated to extend the influence of the court of vienna in the german empire it was to bestow more ecclesiastical principalities upon the archduke maximilian his eyes fell first upon the archbishopric and electorate of cologne and the archbishopric and principality of munster these two countries had one in the same region maximilian friedrich descended from the swabian family of kernesek rosenfels counts of the empire in view of the advanced age of this ruler his death did not seem far distant but it was thought best not to wait for that contingency but to secure the right of succession at once by having the archduke elected coadjutor in cologne and munster their possession was looked upon as a provision worthy of the son of an empress queen as elector and lord of the rhenish shore simultaneously co-director of the westphalian circuit a dignity associated with the archbishopric of munster he could be useful to his house and oppose the prussian influence in the very part of germany where it was largest thus dome begins the seventh chapter of his where in a calm and passionless style he relates the history of the intrigues and negotiations which ended in the election of maria theresia's youngest son on august seventh seventeen eighty as coadjutor to the elector of cologne and on the sixteenth of the same month to that of munster and secured him the peaceful and immediate succession when max friedrich's functions should cease the news of the election at cologne reached bonn on the same day about one o'clock p m the elector proceeded at once to the church of the franciscans used as a chapel since the conflagration of seventeen seventy seven where a musical te deum was sung while all the city bells were ringing von kleist's regiment fired a triple salvo which the cannon on the city walls answered at noon a public dinner was spread in the palace one table setting fifty-four another twenty-four covers in the evening at eight and a half o'clock followed the finest illumination ever seen in bonn which the elector enjoyed riding about in his carriage after this came a grand supper of eighty-two covers then a masked ball to which every decently clad subject as well as any stranger was admitted and which did not come to an end till nearly seven o'clock max franz the new elector 
max franz was in his twenty-eighth year when he came to bonn he was of middle stature strongly built and already inclining to that corpulence which in his last years made him a prodigy of obesity if all the absurdities of his eulogists be taken for truth the last elector of cologne was endowed with every grace of mind and character that ever adorned human nature in fact however he was a good-looking kindly indolent somewhat choleric man fond of a joke affable a hater of stiff ceremony easy of access an honest amiable conscientious ruler who had the wisdom and will to supply his own deficiencies with enlightened and skilful ministers and the good sense to rule through their political foresight and sagacity with an eye as much to the interests of his subjects as his own in his boyhood he was rather stupid swinburne dismisses him in two lines maximilian is a good-natured neither here nor there kind of youth the brilliant witty shrewdly observant mozart wrote to his father november seventeenth seventeen eighty one to whom god gives an office he also gives an understanding this is really the case with the archduke before he became a priest he was much wittier and more intellectual and talked less but more sensibly you ought to see him now stupidity looks out of his eyes he talks eternally always in falsetto he has a swollen neck in a word the man is completely transformed his mother had supplied him with the best instructors that vienna afforded and had sent him travelling pretty extensively for an archduke in those days one of his journeys was to visit his sister marie antoinette in paris where his awkwardness and breaches of etiquette caused as much amusement to the anti-austrian party as they did annoyance to the queen and afterwards to his brother joseph when they came to his ears in seventeen seventy eight he was with joseph in the campaign in bavaria an injury to his knee caused by a fall of his horse is the reason alleged for his abandonment of a military career upon which he was prevailed upon so the historiska taschen book to vienna eighteen o six expresses it to become a candidate for the coadjutorship of cologne if he had to be prevailed upon to enter the church the more to his credit was the course he pursued when once his calling and election were sure the rigid economy which he introduced at court immediately after his accession in seventeen eighty four gave rise to the impression that he was penurious it may be said in his defence that the condition of the finances required retrenchment and reform that he was simple in his tastes and cared nothing for show and magnificence except upon occasions when in his opinion the electoral dignity required them then like his predecessors he was lavish his personal expenses were not great and he waited until his revenues justified it before he indulged to any great extent his passion for the theatre music and dancing stout as he was he was a passionate dancer and his table he was through the nature of his physical constitution an enormous eater though his drink was only water the influence of a ruler upon the tone and character of society in a small capital is very great a change for the better had begun during the time of max friedrich but under his successor a new life entered bonn new objects of ambition were offered to the young men the church and cloisters ceased to be all in all one can well understand how begler in his old age as he looked back half a century to the years when he was student and professor and such a half century with its revolutionary and napoleonic wars its political religious and social changes should write notizen page fifty nine in fact it was a beautiful and in many ways active period in bonn so long as the genial elector max franz maria theresia's youngest son and favourite reigned there how strongly the improved tone of society impressed itself upon the characters of the young is discernible in the many of them who in after years were known as men of large and liberal ideas and became distinguished as jurists theologians and artists or in science and letters 
these were the years of beethoven's youth and early manhood and though his great mental powers were in the main exercised upon his art there is still to be observed through all his life a certain breadth and grandeur in his intellectual character owing in part no doubt to the social influences under which it was developed it is highly honourable to the young max franz that he refused to avail himself of a privilege granted him in a papal bull obtained for him by his mother that of deferring the assumption of priestly vows for a period of ten years but chose rather as soon as he had leisure for the step to enter the seminary in cologne to fit himself for consecration he entered november twenty nine rigidly submitted himself to all the discipline of the institution for the period of eight days when on december eight the nuntius bellisoni ordained him sub-deacon after another eight days on the sixteenth deacon and on the twenty-first priest thus showing that if there be no royal road to mathematics there is a railway with express train for royal personages in pursuit of ecclesiastical science returning to bonn he read his first mass on christmas eve in the florian chapel the cause of science and education the elector had really at heart in seventeen eighty five he had established a botanic garden now he opened a public reading-room in the palace library and sent a message to the theological school in cologne that if the improved course of instruction adopted in austria was not introduced he should found other seminaries on the twenty sixth of june he was present at the opening of a normal school and on august ninth came the decree raising the bonn hochschule to the rank of a university by authority of an imperial diploma upon the suppression of the jesuits in seventeen seventy four max friedrich devoted their possessions and revenues to the cause of education new professorships were established in the gymnasium and in seventeen seventy seven an academy was formed this was the first step the second was to found an independent institution called the lyceum and at his death an application was before the emperor for a university charter max franz pushed the matter obtained the charter from his brother and monday the twentieth of november seventeen eighty six was the day appointed for the solemn inauguration of the new institution the court calendar for the next year names six professors of theology six of jurisprudence civil and ecclesiastical four of medicine and ten of philology and other branches of learning in later editions new names are added in that of seventeen ninety begler is professor of midwifery though economical max franz drew many a man of superior abilities men of letters and artists to bonn and but for the bursting of the storm which was even then gathering over the french border his little capital might well have had a place in german literary history not inferior to that of weimar nor are instances wanting in which he gave generous aid to young talent struggling with poverty though that he did so much for beethoven as is usually thought is at least doubtful this man not a genius not overwhelmingly great mentally nor on the other hand so stupid as the stories told of his boyhood seem to indicate but honest well-meaning ready to adopt and enforce wise measures devised by skilful ministers easy jocose and careless of appearances very fond of music and a patron of letters and science this man to whom in that period of vast intellectual fermentation the index expurgatorius was a dead letter gave the tone to bond society that solid musical education which she had received from her father maria theresia bestowed upon her children and their attainments in the art seemed to have justified the time and labor spent in seventeen forty nine at the age of seven and six christina and maria elizabeth took part in one of the festive musical pieces marie antoinette was able to appreciate gluck 
and lead the party in his favor in later years at paris joseph is as much known in musical as in civil and political history when emperor he had his daily hour of music in his private apartments playing either of several instruments or singing according to the whim of the moment and maximilian the youngest acquired a good degree of skill both in singing and in the treatment of his favorite instrument the viola beethoven once told schindler that the elector thought very highly of matheson in his reminiscences of a visit to vienna in seventeen eighty three j f reichardt gives high praise to the musical interests skill and zeal of emperor joseph and his brother archduke maximilian and a writer in kramer's magazine probably neath tells of a remarkable concert which took place at court in bonn on april five seventeen eighty six at which the elector played the viola duke albrecht the violin and the fascinating countess belderbouche the clavier most charmingly maximilian had become personally acquainted with mozart in salzburg in seventeen seventy five where the young composer had set metastasio's il re pastore to music to be performed in his honor april twenty third from which time to his credit be it said he ever held the composer and his music in kindest remembrance when in seventeen eighty one mozart determined to leave his brutal archbishop of salzburg and remain in vienna the archduke showed at all events a desire to aid him yesterday writes the composer november seventeenth seventeen eighty one the archduke maximilian summoned me to him at three o'clock in the afternoon when i entered he was standing before a stove in the first room awaiting me he came towards me and asked if i had anything to do to-day nothing your royal highness and if i had it would always be a grace to wait upon your royal highness no i do not wish to constrain any one then he said that he was minded to give a concert in the evening for the court of Württemberg. would i play something and accompany the aria i was to come to him again at six o'clock so i played there yesterday mozart was everything to him continues jan he signalized him at every opportunity and said if he were elector of cologne mozart would surely be his chapel master he had also suggested to the princess of Württemberg that she appoint mozart her music teacher but received the reply that if it rested with her she would have chosen him but the emperor for him there is nobody but salieri cries out mozart peevishly had recommended salieri because of the singing and she had to take him for which she was sorry jan gives no reason why mozart was not engaged for bonn perhaps he would have been had lucchese resigned in consequence of the reduction of his salary but he kept his office of chapel master and could not well be dismissed without cause mattioli's resignation was followed by the call of joseph Rica to the place of concert master but for mozart no vacancy occurred at that time maximilian was in vienna during most of the month of october seventeen eighty five and may have desired to secure mozart in some way but just at that time the latter was as his father wrote over head and ears busy with the opera the nozze di figaro old chapel master bono could not live much longer which gave him hope should the opera succeed of obtaining a permanent appointment in vienna and in short his prospects seemed just then so good that his determination if he should really receive an offer from the elector to remain in the great capital rather than to take his young wife so far away from home and friends as the rhine then was and in a manner bury himself in a small town where so few opportunities would probably be given him for the exercise of the vast powers which he was conscious of possessing need not surprise us was it the good or the ill fortune of the boy beethoven that mozart came not to bonn his marvellous original talents were thus left to be developed without the fostering care of one of the very greatest of musical geniuses and one of the profoundest of musical scholars but on the other hand it was not oppressed perhaps crushed by daily intercourse with that genius and scholarship maximilian immediately after reaching bonn as elector ordered full and minute reports to be made out concerning all branches of the administration of the public and court service and of the cost of their maintenance upon these reports were based his arrangements for the future 
those relating to the court music are too important and interesting to be overlooked for they give us details which carry us instantly into the circle which young beethoven had just entered and in which through his father's connection with it he must from earliest childhood have moved they are three in number the first being a list of all the individuals constituting the court chapel the second a detailed description of the singers and players together with estimates of their capabilities the third consists of recommendations touching a reduction in salaries a few paragraphs may be presented here as most intimately connected with significant personages in our history they are combined and given in abstract from the first two documents among the tenors we find father and son in the court chapel j von beethoven aged forty four born in bonn married his wife was thirty-two years old has three sons living in the electorate aged thirteen ten and eight years who are studying music has served twenty-eight years salary three hundred and fifteen florins his voice has long been stale has been long in the service very poor a fair deportment and married among the organists christian gottlob neath aged thirty-six born at chemnitz married his wife is thirty-two has served three years was formerly chapel master with seiler salary four hundred florins christian neath the organist in my humble opinion might well be dismissed inasmuch as he is not particularly versed on the organ moreover is a foreigner having no meriton whatever and of the calvinistic religion ludwig von beethoven aged thirteen born at bonn has served two years no salary ludwig beethoven a son of the beethoven sub number eight has no salary but during the absence of the chapel master lucchesi he played the organ he is of good capability still young of good and quiet deportment and poor one of the items of the third report proposing reductions of salaries and removals has a very special interest as proving that an effort was made to supplant neef and give the post of court organist to young beethoven it reads item if neef were to be dismissed another organist would have to be appointed who if he were to be used only in the chapel could be had for one hundred and fifty florins the same as small young and a son of a court musici and in case of need has filled the place for nearly a year very well the attempt to have neef dismissed from the service failed but a reduction of his salary to the pittance of two hundred florins had already led him to look about him to find an engagement for himself and wife in some theatre when maximilian having become acquainted with his merits notwithstanding his calvinism restored his former allowance by a decree dated february eighth seventeen eighty five when joseph reiche came to bonn in mattioli's place is still undetermined with exactness but a decree raising him from the position of concert master to that of concert director and increasing his salary to one thousand florins bears date june twenty eighth seventeen eighty five in the general payroll of this year reiche's salary is stated to be six hundred and sixty six dollars fifty two alb tenorist beethoven's two hundred thaler beethoven junior one hundred thaler end of chapter five section eight of the life of ludwig van beethoven volume one by alexander wheelock thayer translated by henry edward Krabiel this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six beethoven again the young organist the first visit to vienna death of beethoven's mother sympathetic acquaintances dr wegler's notizen some questions of chronology schindler records and on such points his testimony is good that he had heard beethoven attribute the marvellous development of mozart's genius in great measure to the consistent instruction of his father thus implying his sense of the disadvantages under which he himself laboured from the want of regular and systematic musical training through the period of his childhood and youth it is however by no means certain that had ludwig von beethoven been the son of leopold mozart he would ever have acquired that facility of expression which enabled wolfgang mozart to fill up the richest and most varied scores almost as rapidly as his pen could move 
and so as hardly to need correction as if the development of musical idea was to him a work of mere routine or perhaps better to say of instinct poeta nascitur non fit not only in respect to his thoughts but to his power of clothing them in language many a man of profoundest ideas can never by any amount of study and practice acquire the art of conveying them in a lucid and elegant manner on the other hand there are those whose thoughts never rise above the ordinary level but whose essays are very models of style handel said of the elder telamon that he could compose in eight parts as easily as he handel could write a letter and handel's own facility in composition was something astonishing beethoven on the contrary as his original scores prove earned his bread by the sweat of his brow but no amount of native genius can compensate for the want of thorough training if therefore it be true that nature had in some degree limited his powers of expressing his musical as well as his intellectual ideas so much greater was the need that at the age which he had now reached he should have opportunity to prosecute uninterruptedly a more profound and systematic course of study hence the death of maximilian friedrich which must have seemed to the beethovens at first a sad calamity proved in the end a blessing in disguise for while it did not deprive the boy of the pecuniary benefits of the position to which he had just been appointed it gave him two or three years of comparative leisure uninterrupted save by his share of the organist's duties for his studies which there is every reason to suppose he continued under the guidance of his firm friend neath these three years were a period of theatrical inactivity in bonn for the carnival season of seventeen eighty five the elector engaged berm and his company then playing alternately at cologne aix la chapelle and dusseldorf this troupe during its short season may have furnished the young organist with valuable matter for reflection for in the list of newly studied pieces from october seventeen eighty three to the same month seventeen eighty five thus including the engagement in bonn are gluck's alceste and orpheus four operas of salieri the armida among them sartes fra du litiganti and l'incognito in german translation holzbauer's gunther von schwartzberg and five of paisiello's operas there were says the report in the theatre calendar seventeen eighty six in addition to the old and familiar french operettas zemir et azor sylvain lucille der Praktig, der hausfrund etc etc the three serious vienna operas alceste orpheus and armida in such broad contrast to the general character of the stock pieces of the rhenish companies point directly to maximilian and the bonn season the elector of hesse cassel being then in funds by the sale of his subjects to george the third for the american revolutionary war just closed supported a large french theatrical company complete in the three branches of spoken and musical drama and ballet max franz upon his return from vienna in november seventeen eighty five spent a few days in cassel and upon the death of the elector and the dismissal of the actors a part of this company was engaged to play in bonn during january and february seventeen eighty six the performances were thrice a week monday wednesday and saturday and with but two or three exceptions consisted of a comedy followed by a light opera or operetta the list contains eight of Grétis compositions three of de Seides, two by philidor and one each by sacchini champagne pergolisi gosec frizieri monsigny and schwarzendorf called martini all of light and pleasing character and enjoying then a wide popularity not only in france but throughout the continent meantime grossmann had left frankfort and with close 
previously a manager in hamburg had formed a new company for the cologne bonn and dusseldorf stages this troupe gave the carnival performances in seventeen eighty seven confining them so far as appears to the old round of familiar pieces each of these companies had its own music director with berm was mayor composer of the Ehrlicht and several ballets with the french company jean baptiste rochefort was music master and grossmann had recently engaged berg muller of the bellomo company composer of incidental music for macbeth hence during these years neef's public duties extended no farther than his service as organist for lucchese and Rijke relieved him from all the responsibilities of the church and concert room that the organ service was at this time in part performed by the assistant organist is a matter of course there is also an anecdote related by wegler on the authority of franz Ries, which proves it on tuesday friday and saturday of holy week portions of the lamentations of jeremiah were included in the chapel service recited by a single voice accompanied on the piano forte the organ being interdicted to the familiar gregorian chant tune the boy organist confounds a singer on one occasion in the week ending march twenty seventh seventeen eighty five the vocalist was ferdinand heller too good a musician to be easily disconcerted the accompanist ludwig von beethoven now in his fifteenth year while the singer delivered the long passages of the latin text to the reciting note the accompanist might indulge his fancy restricted only by the solemnity fitted to the service wegler relates that beethoven asked the singer who sat with unusual firmness in the tonal saddle if he would permit him to throw him out and utilize the somewhat too readily granted permission to introduce so wide an excursion in the accompaniment while persistently striking the reciting note with his little finger that the singer got so bewildered that he could not find the closing cadence father reese the first violinist then music director of the electoral chapel still living tells with details how chapel master lucchese who was present was astonished by beethoven's playing in his first access of rage heller entered a complaint against beethoven with the elector who commanded a simpler accompaniment although the spirited and occasionally waggish young prince was amused at the occurrence schindler adds that beethoven in his last years remembered the circumstance and said that the elector had reprimanded him very graciously and forbidden such clever tricks in the future the date is easily determined in holy week seventeen eighty four neither maximilian nor lucchese was in bonn in seventeen eighty six beethoven's skill would no longer have astonished the chapel master of the other characteristic anecdotes related of beethoven's youth there is not one which belongs to this period may seventeen eighty four to april seventeen eighty seven although some have been attributed to it by previous writers nothing is to be added to the record already made except that on the authority of stephen von brunig the youth was once a pupil of franz Ries on the violin which must have been at this time that according to wegler his composition of the song wenn jamand eine reise fut fell in this period and that he wrote three pianoforte quartets the original manuscript of which bore the following title trois quatre pour clavecin violino viola et basso seventeen eighty five composé par de l louis von beethoven âgé treize ans the reader will remark and understand the discrepancy here between the date and the author's age were these quartets intended for publication and for dedication to max franz as the sonatas had been for max friedrich during their author's life they never saw the light but their principal themes even an entire movement became parts of future works they were published in eighteen thirty two by artaria and appears as numbers seventy five and seventy seven series ten in the complete works one family event is recorded in the parish register of st remigius the baptism of maria margaretha josepha daughter of johann von beethoven on may five seventeen eighty six there is a letter from bonn dated april eighth seventeen eighty seven in kramer's magazine two thirteen eighty five 
which contains a passing allusion to beethoven it affords another glimpse of the musical life there our resident city is becoming more and more attractive for music lovers through the gracious patronage of our beloved elector he has a large collection of the most beautiful music and is expending every day to augment it it is to him too that we owe the privilege of hearing often virtuosi on various instruments good singers come seldom the love of music is increasing greatly among the inhabitants the pianoforte is especially liked there are here several hammerclavier by stein of augsburg and other correspondingly good instruments the youthful baron von gudenau plays the pianoforte right bravely and besides young beethoven the children of the chapel master deserve to be mentioned because of their admirable and precociously developed talent all of the sons of herr von mastio play the clavier well as you already know from earlier letters of mine this young genius deserves support to enable him to travel wrote neef in seventeen eighty three in the springtime of seventeen eighty seven the young genius was at length enabled to travel whence or how he obtained the means to defray the expenses of his journey whether aided by the elector or some other mycenas or dependent upon the small savings from his salary and hardly possible from the savings from his music lessons painfully and carefully hoarded for the purpose does not appear the series of papers at dusseldorf is at this point broken so that not even the petition for leave of absence has been discovered the few indications bearing on this point are that he had no farther aid from the elector than the continued payment of his salary what is certain is that the youth now sixteen but passing for a year or two older visited vienna where he received a few lessons from mozart reese in notizen page eighty six that his stay was short and that on his way home he was forced to borrow some money in augsburg when he made the journey he is equally doubtful schindler was told by some old acquaintances of beethoven that on the visit two persons only were deeply impressed upon the lifelong memory of the youth of sixteen years the emperor joseph and mozart if the young artist really had an interview with the emperor it must have occurred before the eleventh of april or after the thirtieth of june for those were the days which began and ended joseph's absence from vienna upon his famous tour to the crimea with the russian empress catherine if before that absence then beethoven was at least three months in the austrian capital and had left bonn before the date of neef's letter to kramer's magazine in which case how could the writer in speaking of his young colleague have omitted all mention of the fact how too could so important a circumstance have been unknown to or forgotten by dr Begler, and have found no place in his notizen which moreover were prepared under the eyes of both franz Ries and madame von bruning it will soon be seen that beethoven was again in bonn before july seventeenth a date which admits the bare possibility of the reported meeting with joseph after his return from russia if an opinion which indeed is little more than a conjecture may be hazarded in relation with this visit it is this that if at any time the missing archives of maximilian's court should come to light it would be found that not until after the busy week for organists and chapel musicians ending with easter was leave of absence granted to beethoven and that too with no farther pecuniary aid from the elector than possibly a quarter or two of his salary in advance in seventeen eighty seven easter monday fell upon the ninth of april the day after the date of neef's letter making due allowance of time for the necessary preparations for so important a journey as in those days it was from bonn to vienna it may be reasonably conjectured that some time in may the youth reached the latter city let another conjecture find place here it is that johann von beethoven had not yet abandoned the hope of deriving pecuniary profit from the precocity of his son's genius that he still expected the boy after replacing his hard organ style of playing by one more suited to the character of the pianoforte to make his dream of a wonder child in some degree a reality hence at what fearful cost to the father in his poverty we know not ludwig is sent to the most admirable pianist the best teacher then living mozart beethoven's introduction to mozart but enough of conjecture the oft-repeated anecdote of beethoven's introduction to mozart is stripped by professor jan of seyfried's superlatives and related in these terms 
beethoven who as a youth of great promise came to vienna in seventeen eighty six question mark but was obliged to return to bonn after a brief sojourn was taken to mozart and at that musician's request played something for him which he taking it for granted that it was a showpiece prepared for the occasion praised in a rather cool manner beethoven observing this begged mozart to give him a theme for improvisation he always played admirably when excited and now he was inspired too by the presence of the master whom he reverenced greatly he played in such a style that mozart whose attention and interest grew more and more finally went silently to some friends who were sitting in an adjoining room and said vivaciously keep your eyes on him some day he will give the world something to talk about rees notizen page eighty six milly says during his visit to vienna he received some instruction from mozart but the latter as beethoven lamented never played for him contrary to the conjecture above mentioned as to johann von beethoven's object in sending his son to vienna it seems from the connection in which rees introduces this remark that the instruction given by mozart to the youth was confined to composition the lessons given were few a fact which accounts for the circumstance that no member of mozart's family in after years when beethoven had become world-renowned has spoken of them if it be considered that poor mozart lost his beloved father may twenty eighth seventeen eighty seven and that his mind was then fully occupied with his new operatic subject don giovanni it will not be thought strange that he did not exhibit his powers as a pianist to a youth just beginning with him a course of study in composition especially as the pupil in his eyes was a little undersized boy of fourteen as there is every reason to believe that pupil's power of handling a theme since mozart probably knew nothing of his five years practice at the organ and in the theatre may well have surprised him but in execution as a pianist he probably stood far far below the master when at the same age below the little hummel at that very time an inmate of mozart's family and certainly below cesarius scheidel forgotten name aged ten who had played a pianoforte concerto between the parts of an oratorio no longer ago than the preceding twenty-second of december in the grand concert of the society of musicians had not beethoven's visit been so abruptly unexpectedly and sorrowfully brought to an end he would doubtless have had nothing to regret on the score of his master's playing in some written talks to beethoven in the years of his deafness still preserved are found two allusions at least made by his nephew to this personal acquaintance with mozart in the first case the words of these you knew mozart where did you see him in the other two or three years later was mozart a good pianoforte player it was then still in its infancy of course beethoven's replies are wanting and herewith is exhausted all that during the researches for this work has been found relating to his first visit in vienna the vienna newspapers of the time contained notices of the wonder children hummel and scheidel but none whatever of beethoven acquaintances in augsburg that the youth in passing through augsburg must have become acquainted with the pianoforte maker stein and his family is self-evident there is something in a conversation book which seems to prove this and also to add evidence to the falsification of his age it is this in the spring of eighteen twenty four andreas streicher and his wife the same stein's model whose appearance at the pianoforte when a child of eight and a half years is so piquantly described by mozart called upon beethoven on their way from vienna into the country a few sentences of the conversation written in the hand of the composer's nephew are preserved the topic for a time is the packing of movables and beethoven's removal into country lodgings for the summer and at length they come upon the instruments manufactured by streicher after which karl writes frau von streicher says that she is delighted that at fourteen years of age you saw the instruments made by her father and now see those of her son true it may be said that this refers to beethoven's knowledge of the stein hammer clavier then in bonn but to any one thoroughly conversant with the subject these words are like iago's trifles light as air confirmation strong of the other view his introduction to the family of the advocate dr schaden in augsburg is certain reichardt was in that city in seventeen ninety and wrote of frau nanette von schaden as being of all the women he knew those of paris not excepted far and away the greatest pianoforte player not excelled perhaps by any virtuoso in skill and certainty 
also a singer with much expression and excellent declamation in every respect an amiable and interesting woman the earliest discovered letter of beethoven to schaden and dated bonn september fifteenth seventeen eighty seven proves the friendship of the schadens for him and fully explains the causes of his sudden departure from vienna and the abrupt termination of his studies with mozart i can easily imagine what you must think of me and i cannot deny that you have good grounds for an unfavourable opinion i shall not however attempt to justify myself until i have explained to you the reasons why i hope my apologies will be accepted i must tell you that from the time i left augsburg my cheerfulness as well as my health began to decline the nearer i came to my native city the more frequent were the letters from my father urging me to travel with all possible speed as my mother was not in a favourable state of health i therefore hurried forward as fast as i could although myself far from well my longing once more to see my dying mother overcame every obstacle and assisted me in surmounting the greatest difficulties i found my mother still alive but in the most deplorable state her disease was consumption and about seven weeks ago after much pain and suffering she died she was such a kind loving mother to me and my best friend ah who was happier than i when i could still utter the sweet name mother and it was heard and to whom can i now speak it only to the silent image resembling her evoked by the power of the imagination i have passed very few pleasant hours since my arrival here having during the whole time been suffering from asthma which may i fear eventually develop into consumption to this is added melancholy almost as great an evil as my malady itself imagine yourself in my place when i shall hope to receive your forgiveness for my long silence you showed me extreme kindness and friendship by lending me three carolines in augsburg but i must entreat your indulgence for a time my journey cost me a great deal and i have not the smallest hopes of earning anything here fate is not propitious to me in bonn pardon my detaining you so long with my chatter it was necessary for my justification i do entreat you not to deprive me of your valuable friendship nothing do i wish so much as in some degree to become worthy of your regard i am with the highest respect your most obedient servant and friend l b beethoven court organist to the elector of cologne death of beethoven's mother the bonn intelligenzblatt supplies a pendant to this sad letter seventeen eighty seven july seventeen died maria magdalena Kovarich, sick named von beethoven aged forty nine years when ferdinand reese some thirteen years later presented his father's letter of introduction to beethoven in vienna the latter read the letter through and said i cannot answer your father just now but do you write to him that i have not forgotten how my mother died he will be satisfied with that later as reese i learned that the family being greatly in need my father had been helpful to him on this occasion in every way a petition of johann von beethoven offered before the death of his wife describing his pitiable condition and asking aid from the elector has not been discovered but the substance of it is found in a volume of geheimer stadt's protocol for seventeen eighty seven in form following your electoral highness has taken possession of this petition july twenty fourth seventeen eighty seven court musician makes obedient representation that he has got into a very unfortunate state because of the long continued sickness of his wife and has already been compelled to sell a portion of his effects and pawn others and that he no longer knows what to do for his sick wife and many children he prays for the benefaction of an advance of one hundred reichtaler on his salary no record is found in the dusseldorf archives of any grant of aid to the distressed family hence so far as now appears the only successful appeal for assistance was made to franz Ries, then a young man of thirty-two years who generously aided in every way his unfortunate colleague where then was the bruning family where graf waldstein to these questions the reply is that beethoven was still unknown to them a reply which involves the utter rejection of the chronology adopted by dr wegler in his notizen of that part of the composer's life this mistake if indeed it proved to be such is one which has been adopted without hesitation by all who have written upon the subject the reader here for the first time finds wegler's account of beethoven's higher intellectual development and his introduction into a more refined social circle placed after instead of before the visit to vienna 
and his introduction to the brunings and balstein dated at the time when youth was developing into the man and not at a point upon the confines of childhood and youth this demands some explanation dr begler's chronology corrected the history of beethoven's bond life would be so sadly imperfect without the notice of dr begler which bear in every line such an impress of perfect candour and honesty that they can be read only with feelings of gratefulest remembrance of their author and with fullest confidence in their authenticity but no more in his case than in others can the reminiscences of an aged man be taken as conclusive evidence in regard to facts and occurrences of years long since past when opposed to contemporary records or involving confusion of dates some slight lapse of memory misapprehension or unlucky adoption of another's mistake may lead astray and be the abundant source of error still it is only with great diffidence and extreme caution that one can undertake the correct and original authority so trustworthy as dr begler such corrections must be made however for only by this can many a difficulty be removed an error in the doctor's chronology might easily be occasioned by the long accepted false date of beethoven's birth insensibly influencing his recollections and certainly when dr begler madame von bruning and franz ries all alike venerable in years as in character sit together discussing in eighteen thirty seven to eight occurrences of seventeen eighty five to eight with nothing to aid their memories and control their reminiscences but an old court calendar or two they may well to some extent have confounded times and seasons in the vague and misty distance of so many years the more easily because the error is one of but two or three years at most bearing upon the point in question is the fact that frau Karth, who distinctly remembers the death of madame von beethoven has no recollections of the young brunings and walstein until after that event some words of dr begler in an unprinted letter to beethoven in eighteen twenty five inasmuch as the house of my mother-in-law was more your domicile than your own especially after you lost your noble mother seem to favour the usually accepted chronology but if beethoven was thus almost a member of the bruning family as early as seventeen eighty five or seventeen eighty six how can the tone of the letter to dr Schaden be explained or how account for the fact that when he reached bonn again and found his mother dying and his father in a very unfortunate state and compelled to sell a portion of his effects and pawn others and knew not what to do it was to franz ries he turned for aid the good doctor is certainly mistaken as to the time when beethoven found messinus's in the elector and walstein why not equally so in relation to the bruning family if now his own account of his intimacy with the young musician given in the preface to the notizen be examined it will be found to strengthen what has just been said born in bonn in seventeen sixty five i became acquainted in seventeen eighty two with the twelve years old lad who however was already known as an author and lived in most intimate association with him uninterruptedly until september seventeen eighty seven and still he could forget that friend's absence in vienna only a few months before when to finish my medical studies i visited the vienna schools and institutions after my return in october seventeen eighty nine we continued to live together in an equally cordial association until beethoven's later departure for vienna towards the close of seventeen ninety two whither i also emigrated in october seventeen ninety four for more than two years then and just at this period dr begler was not in bonn let still another circumstance be noted nothing has been discovered either in the notizen or elsewhere which necessarily implies that begler himself intimately knew the brunings until after his return from vienna in seventeen eighty nine moreover in those days when the distinctions of rank were so strongly marked it is to say the least exceedingly improbable that the son of an immigrant alsatian shoemaker should have obtained entree upon the supposed terms of intimacy in a household in which the oldest child was some six years younger than himself and which belonged to the highest social if not titled rank until he by the force of his talents culture and high character had risen to its level that after so rising the obscurity of his birth was forgotten and the only daughter became his wife is alike honourable to both parties it is unnecessary to pursue the point farther the reader having his attention drawn to it will observe for himself the many less prominent but strongly corroborating circumstances of the narrative which confirm the chronology adopted in it at all events it must stand until new and decisive facts against it be found a year of sadness and gloom my journey cost me a great deal and i have not the smallest hope of earning anything here fate is not propitious to me in bonn 
in poverty ill melancholy despondent motherless ashamed of and depressed by his father's ever-increasing moral infirmity the boy prematurely old from the circumstances in which he had been placed since his eleventh year had yet to bear another sling and arrow of outrageous fortune the little sister now a year and a half old but here is the notice from the intelligence block died november twenty five margaret daughter of the court musician johann von beethoven aged one year and so faded the last hope that the passionate tenderness of beethoven's nature might find scope in the purest of all relations between the sexes that of brother and sister thus in sadness and gloom beethoven's seventeenth year ended end of section eight